spiders, many eyes slay. Jumped her down, is my domain. And when I'm done, none of this will remain. There will be a reckoning! Welcome, welcome everybody to the Calling All Heroes Rise Together Minor 3, hosted by Toronto Defiance. How fitting it is that the team that tells us we should rise together is giving a place for marginalized gender players and talent to do just that. My name is CB, and I am so excited to get to be here to kick it all off with you, and I'm super excited to do it with my good friend and co-caster, Jag, who I know is just as excited as I am. Oh, I am so thrilled to be here, CB. I know you already got to experience Calling All Heroes earlier on during Minor 1. Now, I get to be here for Minor 3 with you. We're going to have an amazing set of games, but most importantly, this tournament, this circuit, is just so incredible. It's a great place for underrepresented genders to be able to play at the highest level. I can't wait to see what we have in store for us today. I, You said it. I mean, like, I, I will never stop touting, uh, you know, how much I love calling all heroes and how important it is it's a great place for marginalized gender players underrepresented communities to come together have a place to cultivate you know get both talent and players on all sides uplift everybody a variety of roles and just make it a great place for these players to get together and have some sick competition like you love to see it right you love to have yeah. these players having a place to cultivate and grow as talent and i'll never stop singing its praises i love this program so much you and me as well and as well as everyone who is joining us here today but it has been quite the journey to get here to minor three we've already had a year worth of competition i mean look at all these amazing events that we already had last month minor two of the washington justice and here we are now today minor three uh it's getting down to the nitty-gritty there are not a whole lot of events left before the championship in the last chance qualifier this is one of the last chances teams have to be able to get those circuit points that are oh so important if they want that automatic spot to get into the championship tournament later on in February. Absolutely, that that, that championship tournament is gonna be the big paycheck, that's the big money, that's the big one that all these players are playing for, but you know, of course we do have, uh, we do have just today's tournament to focus on, or sorry, this uh, this current tournament for now to get there, that's our current stop on the road to that championships, where today we're gonna kick things off with some of our Swiss rounds. We're going through six Swiss rounds today. That's going to be the first three today and the next three tomorrow. And the top eight teams are going to qualify for that double elimination bracket next week where they're going to be playing for that cash prize and for, like you said, those all-important circuit points that are going to be an increasingly short supply as time goes on. Yeah, it means that there are some chances where you can slip up here in the first, the second round, maybe even the third round, and still have a possibility to qualify for that double elimination bracket that's going to be happening next week. But it is going to be a first to two all day today, so not a lot of room for error when it comes to those maps. You fall down one and you already are falling down a pretty big rabbit hole. You really got to start off strong to get going. But there is a lot on the line as you said it's not just circuit points we also have some cash prizes as well two thousand three hundred dollars canadian for first one thousand eight hundred canadian dollars for second one thousand four hundred canadian dollars for third and then last but not least if you get fourth one thousand one hundred canadian dollars as well as the circuit points that are being assigned not per team but per player I, I mean, the cash prize is definitely going to be a big motivator for a lot of these players, but the real motivator, in my opinion, does need to be those circuit points because you want to make sure that you have enough to qualify for the championships, lest you have to, you know, brave your way through the hurricane that's going to be LCQ to try and get there because that's where, again, the big the big tournament's going to be. If you're not there, you di it's because you didn't come correct. It's because you didn't come correct when you had to. And like we said, there are fewer and fewer opportunities after this. Again, only one more major tournament after today or after this weekend sorry 
Yeah, and there are some teams already that are looking great, that are in great shape to make that championship bracket in February. Washington Timeless, Valiant Guardians, two of the teams that are really high up in those standings have a lot of circuit points to their names. But there are some other teams, Vancouver Titans Blue, Fable Trainers, you know, they've been doing really well in these tournaments, but they are kind of on that bubble where they could potentially get knocked out if they don't have some good upcoming tournaments like today, tomorrow, next weekend, as well as Major 3 upcoming. So there is a lot on the line here. Yeah, they're going to have to take the most of those opportunities to earn those those tournament points uh, and to earn that cash prize. But hey, you as the viewer, you can be earning some things as well. If you're here, especially on the Overwatch Contenders channel, we got some skins for you. You love skins, chat. If you stick around, watch Calling All Heroes and support the stream on the Overwatch Contenders channel, you can get yourself a lovely Tier 2 Mercy skin there. And, uh, you know, later on, we're going to have the Kiriko and the Hanzo ones available as well. But stick around today and you can get your own personal Overwatch Contenders Guardian Angel. I want that skin. I'm not going to lie. I, I, <laughs> I think Mercy, very underrated hero. I think it takes a lot of skill to play her at the highest level. Representing her for the Path to Pro, for Contenders, is an awesome thing to do. So I got to have the stream up myself so I can get it as well, CB. I don't know about you, but as we just wrap gonna, like, that up... I'm probably just gonna like, you know, speak to the tournament admins and be like, hey, I was casting, can I like get the, the skins? Just, can you just like please. slide them my way? Yeah. Please, can I, can I please have some <laughs> contender skins? Please, that is all I asked for. But as we wrap up that, uh, we gotta talk about our first matchup of the day. It is Swiss, so you know, we're gonna see a lot of different matchups based on kind of win-loss throughout today and tomorrow, but we got a bit of a banger to start things off. Trainers versus Yippie Carry. I think this is gonna be a very interesting matchup, one that we haven't necessarily seen on Calling All Heroes, but We've seen these te two teams in performance um, in some other tournaments recently. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think this is going to be a great match to kind of get set the tone for how we're going to kick things off today. Drainers as a team has been, uh, you know, they had a really strong performance in the last minor. I think they placed third place in that one. And between then and now, had an absolutely stellar performance in a uh, another community tournament, the Kunoichi Kerfuffle, where they played in both the NA and EU brackets for that tournament and won both of them in the same day. And there was a lot of other Calling All Heroes teams, uh, you know, playing as a collective in that tournament, as well as some of the talent being scattered about some of the other rosters there. But that shows that this team is capable of showing up. However, they're showing up today with a slightly different DPS core than the one that made that incredible feat. They no longer have Peace, they now have Ives. And Senna is gonna be out this weekend, so we have KJ stepping in. But that's still a very competent DPS line. I mean, you still look at this roster and it starts at a Kindred from New York Excelsior Academy, one of the best tank players that we have in the Calling All Heroes scene. Uh, previously going by Wicca, now going by Scarlet on the support role. Also very, very good and highly touted in that role. So we're going to see a lot of former NYXLA all over Calling All Heroes throughout this weekend and next weekend. And like you said, I mean, they did really well. And that was a tournament, like you said, even though it was a bit of a different roster, they beat a full Valiant Guardians. Are they at least yeah. placed above them in the North American tournament? No, no, no. They, they, they won. They, they won the the whole thing. They're like, yeah, no. This team is a, is quickly racking up a lot of the accolades. And you know, despite only coming together as a collective in the previous minor tournament, making a big showing there. You know, making some of the other top tier teams sweat. The ones that did eventually end up walking away with it. And then coming through in that tournament and just wiping the floor with all of them in both regions. It says a lot, but their opponents are a mainstay of Calling All Heroes pretty much since day one. Team Yippie Carry, and uh, yeah, they are grinders. They've been around as a collective, not making too many roster swaps since the inception of Calling All Heroes. And, you know, that's... <laughs> I mean, Drainers have to be the favorites, but Yippie Carry, like, they're a team that can absolutely surprise you, especially if Drainers come with a slow start today. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you look at this lineup, you look at Sunshine, a very popular streamer in the Overwatch community, has a huge following, a very good hit scan player. We'll see what she can do. But I also kind of want to look at this organization as a whole. You see up there, their manager's Ocean, GM for Team Ireland in this World Cup, also previously owned a contenders team in Korea. And then also this organization, um, you know, Yippie Carry, kind of a newer team overall, not like the actual lineup, but the brand. But this is part of Carry Esports, which has been around for, you know, about a year or two playing in other esports titles, usually in those tactical shooters. So they have this, I would say, infrastructure that some other teams may not have. You know, they have these managers, they have these coaches, they have a lot of resources at their disposal that even the best players might not have. It's more of a 
pickup style team. So even though they might be the underdogs, I'm very curious to see if that infrastructure, if that organizational prowess that they have can give them a leg up potentially and help them get this upset. They, yeah, they also ha they have that and the team cohesion again, like I said, from being you know around since the inception of Calling All Heroes, they're definitely a team that can make some noise. They've been on the outside looking in for a lot of the playoffs throughout there, but like I said, they feel like a team on the rise. They are grinders. They are capable of bigger things, but going up against Drainers in the first round gotta feel a little bit scary. Again, you're kind of hoping for Drainers to have a really slow start and maybe have Sunshine to have a big pop-off game and hope that that's enough to carry you to victory. Either that or rely on the team cohesion, rely on the organizational structure backing this team, you know, all of that. Yeah, you got to bring all of that to the table and come correct here. It's only the first round, but you still want to make sure that you get out ahead of the pack. Well, if you're going to rise, you got to rise together and hopefully the map pool will be in their favor. We're going to see exactly what that looks like in just a moment. Lay out all the potential maps throughout the entirety of the tournament. We're going to be starting out on control and the first round, it's already been predetermined. For this one, it's going to be Oasis, but after that, it's going to be Loser's Pick. So you could see Nabani, Midtown, Eichenwald. If it goes to map three, Flashpoint, New Junk City, Suravasta, and today... It could be a, four, a fourth map with push as a tiebreaker, Coliseo, New Queen Street. We're not going to be seeing Escort, unfortunately, until next weekend for playoffs when there is a first to three format. But still a pretty solid map. Well, I'm very excited to see what teams are able to pull out here. We, we might see Escort if one of these teams manages to find a way to draw on either Control or Flashpoint. It hasn't been done yet, but these are some <laughs> real trailblazers we have here. Surely someone can crack that potential code and then also, you know... Maybe, okay, I haven't figured out push yet. They just leave the bot in the center. We could we could find a way. I think it's possible. No one touches it. Just like, yeah. they literally just don't touch it throughout the entirety of the 10 minutes. They just leave it there right in the center. I think that is the only way that could work. But it could happen. It actually could happen. I don't think it's going to happen. But if it does, we, this would definitely be a record-setting occasion. Oh, well... As we uh, as we kind of shift into Oasis, which I think is impossible to draw, I don't even know if I can come up with a, a harebrained scheme for that one. We're going to be looking to see what maps come up first. You know, we talked again about Drainers and their roster, and you highlighted Kindred, and I'm really glad you did, because I tout her as potentially the best Junker Queen in all of Calling All Heroes. I say potentially because there's always a couple other contenders out there, but I've always been a huge fan of her Junker Queen play, and I, in my opinion, it's one of the best. But she's also liked to play a lot of the Reinhardt as of late, along with the rest of Team Drainers. They've, you know, they've come out with some of that like London Spitfire-esque Rhine Rush from time to time. That's kind of what got them those victories in the Kunoichi Kerfuffle. That and a little bit of flexibility. So whatever kind of pain train the Drainers come out here with, Kindred is going to be the one driving it. So whatever she's on, pay close attention. Absolutely. And, you know, the Jinker Queen gives you a bit more mobility because you have your shout, gives everyone shields and also some increased movement. Also, I'd say a little bit more upfront damage, sustainability with her Jagged Knife being able to heal her. Ryan, I feel like, plays a bit more passively, except when you're ready to charge in full steam ahead. You can also go for some fire strikes from just God knows where. I mean, we saw Hottie in Overwatch League playoffs hit some insane ones. Basically, was playing Widowmaker with those fire strikes. So we'll, I think that will really kind of show us what kind of tempo or what kind of brawl they're playing. Either one that's a bit slower paced, but more wait for your DPS to do a lot of damage and then engage. Or the Junker Queen, you're running in straight ahead and she is just going to be leading the full team. But it is going to be, it looks like, University to start things off, which is going to be very good, I believe, for the side of Drainers, because if they want to play this Brawl style, this is potentially the best sub-map on Oasis for it. Yeah, I think if we end up going to City Center, that's going to be the one to try and keep an eye on. It's going to be the most different, the biggest outlier. Because, you know, we talk about the Junker Queen, we talk about the Reinhardt and how they're both very in-your-face Brawl, just one a little bit more passive than the other, but... With both Gardens and with University, we are actually starting out on Gardens. Either of those can be favored on that pretend, like on these sub maps. Yeah, I think high ground is a lot more important here on Gardens because that is a big part of the point itself and kind of taking control of the objective early on. I would say less so on University, but as you can see, like already, EP Carry, they're going to rotate. They're going to try to take that high ground. And they're going to try to set their Bastion. So the Zarya going to be coming out to play into a Sigma. So actually not what we expected at all. It's going to be more of a poke comp that's coming out from Trainers. But they'll have a big shield to be able to protect their Bastion. Where for Terra, once you run out of bubbles, I mean, you don't really have anything that can protect your Bastion at all. I mean, this composition from Drainers is essentially the composition that won Florida Mayhem the championship. So, you know, they've done their homework. They have scouted it all out. And they've already taken down Kayla's Immortality Field. And they've knocked... 
Yo, they lost KJ. He gets booped right off the map there by Unlucky, and Scarlet gonna follow. That's what a two piece there to open it up. Unlucky main with the two environmental kills. Yippee Carry gonna take first control off of that one, and now Kindred is just kind of left alone on an island. Her and Yves are gonna follow, and Yippee Carry taking first control. Kayla, they do have to use the immortality field to make sure no one gets staggered, but huge plays. I mean, Unlucky main, they gotta re they gotta change their name after that. I think. They gotta go by luckiest person or just most skilled person in the lobby after those very nice sound waves to boop off the support line from Drainers. But they nah, got nah, the nah, capture no, before no that fight required. was even over. No luck, no luck just that all was, that skill. Was right, right place, right time, knowing exactly where to be, where they were about to poke their heads out and making them pay for it. But now Kindred are gonna go ahead and take a different approach. Not gonna, you know, go through that choke point and risk getting booped off again. This time just taking an approach from main. But they can't really fully commit though. They don't have uh, they don't have KJ set up on the Bastion much of anywhere. Zepturn though with an early ant mage, but they already lose Scarlet going in. They do manage to take down Unlucky, but that's not a great trade to lose your uh, your you lose a support that early on the way in. Gravitic Flux gonna come out from Kindred though, but it whips and Yippee Carry. They're able to hold on strong. They take down KJ, and it's once again just Kindred. That was a pretty bad fight for the Drainers there. Yeah, they lose two ultimates. They only get one out of Kayla. Now, Eevee Carry, they're going to have both DPS ultimates, a sound barrier, almost a Graviton Surge. They have everything to put this away. And the most dangerous thing is that because they lost that first fight, took them so long, they got so staggered out. This is basically last fight territory. They could get 100 to 0 here on the first point of Oasis. And especially if Eevee Carry cycle these ults out, and Reese's Feast is going to go ahead and pop the Dragon Blade. Already two down for the Drainers. It's looking like Yippee Carry is just going to walk away with this one. And that's one ult invested for a full one, one team fight and less than 10 seconds for anyone from Drainers to touch. KJ definitely not going to be the one to do it as they're going to go ahead and pop that artillery strike. Scarlet does sneak in the back door. She's able to trigger OT, but is there going to be a follow-up touch? It looks like it's going to have to be her again. Actually, Kindred pins in, hitting Terra, but the sound barrier from Unlucky means she's going to be sitting pretty there with that, uh, with all that over health. Unlucky pressuring Scarlet away and Drainers they don't have any ultimate abilities. They don't really have much of anything. They don't even have positioning. They don't have a tank any longer. They're able to pop that blizzard there from Yves, but is anybody gonna get is anybody gonna get caught up? And it looks like no. Sunshine and Terra just mopping the floor with the remainders of the drainers, and that's gonna be Gardens going the way of Yippie Carry, surely, once they deal with Scarlet. Down the drain they go. Not the expected result whatsoever based on past tournament performance. But Yippie Carry, they come out. With the Zarya composition, it works wonders. I cannot understate how good Unlucky Main was to open things up. If they don't get those Soundwave kills, they don't get those boops off the map, this could have been a completely first sub map. But they just completely changed the game, and from there, Yippie Carry, they take control, literally, and they never let go. I, I thought, actually, it was a little bit touch and go at the end. The charge in from Kindred, it seems like Yippie Carry was a bit split. They used the sound barrier to catch everyone. Um, you know, the, I think the Graviton Search also wasn't the most high value impact, but they get it done. That's a great way. You said yourself, they have to start this out fast. They got to start this out and play excellent. That is exactly what they've done. But can they keep that momentum going now that we are at city center? Yeah, this is going to be the one to watch again, because you don't have the rush favored, uh, geometry, Ki you know, Kindred's still going to default over to that Junker Queen, her comfort pick. Again, I tout her as one of the best in calling all heroes on this hero, but is she going to be able to find a whole lot of purchase there with the space? They do actually manage to take down Reese's Species, and that's a great two-piece to open things up there for Yves. If they're able to take down Sunshine, I think they're pretty much set for life. The Immortality Field already blown from Kayla off the field. KJ takes down Sunshine, and that's it. Yeah, that's it. That's the fight there. Drainers, they clap back after losing Gardens and take, uh, take first cap on City Center. You guys understanding purposely how to play this Genji when you see someone weak, you just dash and you get that final blow, you get the reset, and you keep going for more. There are those Genji plays, huge follow up. It seems like Drainers, despite losing that first sub map, they have reawoken and they're looking for blood as no, not a lot of whole ultimates built up just yet, but winning that neutral fight and getting a lot of play percentage right off the get go really looking really nice. You can carry, they're gonna find a way back in. You can see that Drainers are just playing natural cover really well. Yeah, they're trying to bait Yippie Carry in, and it's looking like Reese's is taking a little bit of the bait there, doing a little bit of limit testing, though. Yves goes in a little bit too deep, and Reese's is there with a the punish, and yeah, Drainers, they might have overextended just a wee bit, and Yippie Carry is going to be happy to take advantage of it. The lamp comes out from Zepturn, but it's quickly dealt with, and 
the remainders of Drainers are on the back foot. You see Zep turn getting taken down there. Sunshine with the cleanup, a nice little dash, and if you carry at about 50%, gonna clap back. That must be putting in a lot of work. They have gotten their Ant Matrix now twice really quickly. They're actually the first one to get an ultimate here on this second point, despite the fact that they didn't win that first fight. So they must be doing some insane healing, some insane damage that's helping them get these ultimates, but that could be a huge game changer here if they are able to get that window off quickly. This is going to be where it gets really dangerous. Ant Matrix has come out, but you still have Sunshine set up on the Bastion. He's a very difficult hero to dislodge, and you can tell the Drainers don't want none of that, but they're going to go ahead and get an early pick off there. It's AJ taking down Reese's, and that's going to give him a window to pop that overclock and hopefully take down Sunshine, but the grenade is there with a little boop to follow it up, and KJ overextends just a little, little bit as well. And, I mean, Drainers are still able to find a fair bit, but that looks a little bit touch and go there for a second. It's going to be Yippee Care dropping the point at about 40% to Drainers who flip it back in their favor. Yep, it's going to be the flip back immediately back and forth. The point continues to go, but Drainers overall, the ones in a better alt bank position, they do use two there to win that one out. But I feel like this ultimate coming out from the Junker Queen could be everything. The Rampage, especially because there is no sound barrier on the other side from the Lucky Man. It's actually going to be the Bastion Artillery Strike that starts itself. It's going to force out the sound barrier because of the Graviton Surge that was used in combination. Yeah, the Graviton Surge was thrown up on the high ground, but it doesn't look like there was anybody there to follow up on it. And yeah, everybody just falls. I mean, Scarlet invests the sound barrier, and the rest of Drainers just go aggressive, those that aren't currently tied up in a, in a Graviton Surge way up on the high ground. But yeah, Drainers, they're able to just weather that storm with a little bit of an investment there. And they are now swapping their comp completely, but they are keeping their sound barrier. They're keeping their blade, and they're going to have to go quickly. But Drainers, they do win that fight, but they use everything to get the job done. So they are not in a great standing. Alt bank wise, you can carry it. They should win this unless things go horribly wrong, but they lose Terra! Yeah, that's a great way for it to go horribly wrong, losing your tank that early, and Kindred is on the prowl looking for the backline. Reese's popped the Dragon Blade, but is only able to find one for it. The Sound Barrier comes out, but the body blocking from Kindred means nobody from Yippie Carry can touch the point, and the Drainers will take City Center. And now we're going to University, where this Junker Queen can be a very scary pick. Oh, this is where it's going to be scary. So you combo with a May, you block someone off of the wall, and they are absolutely done for. We'll see if that May comes out into fruition. But I want to go back to that last fight really quickly. If you care, I really thought they had that in the bag. It just feels like some miscommunication there. The Winston jumping in a little bit too early as the touch gets forced off that high ground. I mean, they had beat, they had blade. You got to wonder if they played that a little bit more patiently, if that could have gone differently. But instead... Going to university where drainers probably feel the most confident. It doesn't look like that maze is going to come out, but it feels like all of a sudden they're in the driver's seat. They get 100 to 0 on that first sub map, but they have completely turned the momentum around. Yeah, I mean, going back to that fight, I do think it was the play there would have been to go in with the sound barrier, but it was just a little bit too late to save Terra. So Terra swapping back now over onto Old Reliable for University, going back with that Zarya. Hopefully she's going to be able to get better use out of the Graviton Surge when she gets it there. But Kindred going to go super aggressive and Immortality Field to try and help her out, but they are able to burst down Sunshine. And without that Bastion on the field, it should be a lot more free to take more space, but not without Zepturn or Yvesk. Yippie Carry gonna go ahead and take down two. They can't really go too aggressive though, because Kindred is still on the prowl. And, you know, Drainers, it's scrappy. They lose a couple bodies on the way in, but they do get first cap here. And it's another situation where you have Sunshine on the Bastion, but you can't really get her set up. Zep turn there with one of the plays of the game. She throws in the immortality field. That's what you gotta do when you have an aggressive tank like this. You throw it onto them as they fall weak. You get heal them healed up. They got the Jagged Knife to heal themselves. You also just throw in the primary healing, and they are able to sustain throughout all of that. Unlike Terra, who unfortunately just doesn't have the same sort of support when they try to go in. And because of that, Drainer's able to win that first fight out. And you can carry, they are not giving up. They gotta Any stop shout? Kindred. They gotta let them not go in like that. Like, Kayla's just obliterated. Yeah, the commanding shout comes out and everybody from Drainers just walks forward on that. Yippee carry, everybody's low HP. They don't really have a whole lot of sustainability and they're scattered as well. And that's gonna be a late kill onto Unlucky Main there. It's like, at 40%, it's gonna be, you know, Yippee carry, they have a couple more fights here, but that was a, a pretty clean fight there from Drainers. A dry fight too. They use absolutely nothing. They're getting ultimates online. If they rotate these well enough, they could be reverse sweeping the first map of the series of this tournament on stream. And it's looking very, very good for them. I think you'd be carried. They got to play a bit more passive right now. But how do you do that when they keep running on top of you? Like, there's no room for breathing right now with this Junker Queen. They just continue. Kindred continues just to run on top of your backline. 
you can't really be passive. You have to go aggressive to try and get Sunshine set up. But Kindred is not going to let that happen with a Gracie to the face. Takes down Sunshine. And Yippie Carry, they don't have a leg to stand on right now because Drainers just kicked it right out from underneath them. Kayla even invested that Ant Major to try and get Sunshine in position, but it's no good. And again, it's a dry fight from Drainers. They don't invest anything, and now they have everything. They have an alt apocalypse, as my good friend Subflint's coined a long time ago. They're gonna use the first one, the application matrix, but it's gonna be the blade in response. Yeah, but the sound barrier from there is there from Scarlet, and that blade is looking pretty dull there. Reese's even gets low and has to back up to the immortality field. KJ pops that overclock, takes down Terra. Now you got no tank, now you got no space. It's a token artillery strike coming out from Sunshine, but the rest of Yippie Carry have fallen, and Drainers will take Oasis in a clean 100 to 0 on University. Gardens looked a little bit shaky, but the other two maps were all drainers all the time. It just seemed like they were leveling up throughout the series, continued to get their power level up higher and higher. The second map of the series, a little bit more back and forth. We saw some, you know, the point being flipped on City Center quite a bit, but here they answer getting 0 to 100 with 100 to 0 of their own. They never gave up control and the tempo of their play. We talked about this at the very beginning of this map. If we saw Kindred playing the Junker Queen versus the Reinhardt, the Junker Queen had to be aggressive. You had to constantly be running in to their front line, their back line, just anyone you can. That's exactly what they did at the end. You could see that synergy, that coercion was getting better and better as time went on. And the, the, the result is expected. The way they got there, not so much. I, I like, all the, by the way, how you called out the aggressive use of the immortality field there from Zepturn, because like I said, you know, Kindred, she's one of the best, if not the best Junker Queen in Ka. And if you have the best Junker Queen on your team, you're going to know how to play in a way that's going to enable her to be as aggressive as she wants to be to get the value that she wants to have. She was constantly in Sunshine's face, not letting that Bastion set up. And if you play tank on live patch right now, you know you are terrified of that little Omnic thing and just the amount of burst damage that he can put down he can just melt you in in a second it makes playing tank miserable but not if your name is kindred not if you have zepter using the immortality fields to keep that aggression in check going just right into the eye of the storm and taking down the bastion over and over again you don't let him set up he gets no value yeah, it's very true. And uh, I, I mean, I have some insight as the social media manager for the Spitfire. Uh, the comms basically, when we play Rhine comps, is like literally Hottie just yelling for a lamp from Landon. Yeah. So I'm assuming it's something like that, like, like this lamp, lamp, lamp. Like, you know, like, I I'm weak, I'm going in, nothing can stop me. This is either a one-way trip, or you're going to save me and we're going to win this fight. That's kind of how you have to play, like, pedal to the metal. They cannot give up any sort of room because with that bastion on the other side if you give them that alleyway to shoot through they are just going to melt you down so making sunshine uncomfortable forcing her into a spot where she is getting run up on where she can't really be as much of a damage dealer she wants to be as they were or just even going for the back lane right off the bat so there's no healing when sunshine gets weak or when terra gets weak i mean that is just a winning scenario every single time and again like it was a bit of a slow start i think we saw them try to play something a little bit different you know, the Sigma comp, it did work for the Florida Mayhem, like you said, but just like every other team in playoffs, I mean, they're playing what they're comfortable at. This meta isn't really a meta, I would say. Sure, there are some, like, prearranged comps, but most teams are just playing what they're good at, and they are making it work. It's entirely possible that that comp that they came out with, you know, the Florida Mayhem Sigma composition there was just them, like, trying on a new pair of shoes to see if they could walk, Why see not? if they could maybe run in them. They stumbled, they could barely crawl <laughs> with it, but, you know, it was a suboptimal map for that kind of composition. Like... Gardens is a lot better for like something more dive centric or something brawl. The poke comp with the Sigma, that's not that's not where he lives. That's not where he likes to be. So, you know, just try it on a new pair of shoes, seeing if it fits. It didn't. We go back to old reliable. We go back to what we're good at. We go back to Junker Queen aggression, that team cohesion, having faith in your backline to have that lamp there for you when you need it, and just don't let Yippie Carry get set up because you know. Sorry, I almost dropped my Apple Pencil. Uh, you know how dangerous that Bastion can be once he is set up and once he's able to melt out, put out all that damage. I I can't stress enough how much I hate playing tank against Bastion right now. Like, I'm a support main, and I'm always like, I want to try other roles. Well, maybe I'll try tank, and then I play one game, and then I'm like, I don't want to try tank anymore. I'm done. The other team swapped Bastion, <laughs> ruined my fun. No one else in the lobby gets to have fun. Bastion is a fun ruiner, confirmed. But we will be moving on to the next map in our series. We'll see if Bastion can ruin the fun for that as well. It is going to be Yippie Carry's pick. I'm very intrigued to see what they go with here because it seems like they really want to commit to that Zarya composition. If I was them, I'd go for Midtown. I think Midtown gives you the best opportunity to kind of run that Zarya, take some high ground, doesn't allow necessarily 
the Junker Queen to run into you. I, I don't know really if there is a potential Symmetric Comp that Strainers could run, because I feel like that would make Midtown work for them. But if not, I, I feel like if they want to stick to what they've been doing, that's the best bet. Uh, I would not choose them Bonnie though. I mean, we, we've seen these teams not really go for dive just yet. Eichenwald would be an interesting one. I feel like Eichenwald would be more towards the strengths of what we've seen so far from um, Drainer. So that's why my vote would be for Midtown if I was in EP Carry's coaching room right now. M Midtown probably makes the most sense, but I feel like, you know, if you want to play to the enemy team's weaknesses, that maybe Nubani might be a good shout because, you know, Kindred, again, very great on those brawl tanks but how is she on the winston oh, we might have to find pick. out yeah i mean he's quite, winston's kind of fallen out of favor but hey you know we all we're also watching some of the uh some of the matches from the previous minor and even some of the matches that were played you know ever since then from between then and now there's also a lot of teams that are playing something a little bit more rush centric or a little bit more poke centric to try and just control the high ground on nimbani rather than the, the dive compositions to challenge it so are either of these teams going to try and play the dive? And if they do, is that a trap? I think you bring up a great point. Is It's like, do we play to our strengths or to our enemy's weakness? And I think here they're trying to play to potentially the whole team of Drainers, but specifically potentially Kindred's weakness here, where we saw the wins, uh, we saw the Sigma did not look great. On the other side, we did see Terra play the Winston, also didn't look that fantastic in like the five seconds we got to see of it because they immediately got blown off the map, unfortunately, just got blown up into smithereens. But with this, it could be a chance for them to show that they can be a Winston player, or they just force more of that poke uh, style composition. They want to play Sigma into Sigma. Uh, I We haven't really seen Sigma at all from the side of Yippie Carry, but if they can force that matchup, maybe that's one that they favor. Uh, you know, Maybe they can get Sunshine set up in better positions, especially behind the Sigma shield that can really be that game-changing defensive utility that helps them stay alive. It means they don't have to play you know, as scared. They don't maybe have to play as defensive. They're not as worried about someone running up on them because also Sigma does have that accretion, does have that big rock they could just chunk at someone that's going to crowd control them into oblivion where they get stunned for a little bit. So this could be a bit more defensive and a bit more in their favor. Speaking of defensive, when Drainers go on the defensive here, I kind of want to keep an eye on KJ because I have a feeling that if she goes for a hitscan centric hero like, say, Ash, which is one of her signature heroes, that uh, it might be a very dangerous thing for Yippie Carry to try and play into because she is lethal on hitscan heroes. By the way, you know, we talk I talked about Senna being on this roster as well, being their starting hitscan player. The fact that KJ is on their bench is absolutely insane. You have two incredible hitscan players ready to go at a moment's notice. And if you have either of them set up on the high ground here on Nimbani, uh, you better keep your head on a swivel or you're gonna lose it. Yeah, I mean, that just shows you the talent that Janus has, and that's why they're a top four team right now. We talked about the top three finish in the last minor, but currently sitting at fourth in the standings, looking like they're in a great position to potentially qualify for the championship event, just straight out the gate. They continue to put on these strong performances, and it's off the back of these DPS plays. Uh, I think we've talked a lot about Kindred, um, but I mean, both Ives and KJ have been putting up some great numbers thus far. We'll see if they can continue that. It looks like we're going to see uh, it's a Yippie Carry on attack first. It's going to be yeah. interesting if they bring out the Doomfist. This would be something that we haven't really seen a lot of so far, at least in the Calling All Heroes VODs that I watched. But playing into a Rhine, I really like this. Uh, obviously, there's the tank uh, knock, uh, knockback passive, which makes them a little bit more resistant to that. But if you can displace that Rhine constantly... I mean, it can work wonders. We'll see what Terra ends up doing right now. They're on Roadhog. They're actually going to go to Winston when all is said and done. I'd love for them to try the uh, Doomfist if this doesn't work out, but they're going to go for that more traditional dive setup. One thing that I am intrigued about is there's no Mercy to uh, pocket the Echo. They're going to go for speed instead, which makes me think they're going to play a little bit more together with this Lucio and try to take either the high ground or just the point and force them to uh, fight them there. The problem, though, is that that doesn't really give Kayla an opportunity to, you know, have a whole lot of agency in the fight. She can, or they can maybe hit a couple of grenades, a couple of sleep darts from afar, but, you know, without Sunshine to pressure the back line, it's not, I don't think you're going to be able to fi find much purchase off of any of those grenades, and I think they know it. Kayla not going to stick their head out for too long. The rest of Yippie Carry going to just try and reassess here, as this is a very difficult nut to crack here with Kindred up on the high ground. She's going to go ahead and drop down and pressure out Terra. Big sleep dart coming out and a lot of damage actually on Drainers, but the lamp from Zep's turn is good. Keeps everybody alive. And now the fight's happening on the low ground, but Terra going to go ahead and make the dive up onto the high ground, but KJ finds first blood, takes down Reese's, and Terra, yeah, you don't want to jump into that. That is the last place that you want your Winston to be, and Terra's is going to head on out. 
And if you're Yippie Carry, how do you crack this? Doomfist, go Doomfist. I don't <laughs> think that Winston is be able to crack this code. I mean, Winston's great at like challenging high ground, but you can see that Drainers, they're playing a bit split. They're just putting their Ryan on the low ground and then like saying like, either you can go for this tank that's just never gonna end up falling. Or you're gonna try to go for a squishier characters, but we're also gonna do a ton of damage with the Echo. I mean, the focusing beam, the sticky grenades that can melt someone, Bastion's primary fire as well as the grenade can also just melt someone. So it's so hard to just jump into them. They're gonna swap to this Genji, so this deflect, maybe he's able to get some relief, a little bit less damage at them, maybe even force some damage back at them but this dive is not to be like perfect it, it, it's a full dive so you definitely want to be perfect and it looks like the intro to that is perfect reese's going in with a 2k that's pretty high value picks there and kendrick gonna fall as well so maybe the dive comp is just what the doctor ordered yippee carry staking their claim on the point they're gonna get at least two ticks here before anybody from drainers is able to contest if at all and i mean what a great couple of entry frags there once again it's reese's coming through with the big plays that yippee carry need to crack that defense yeah, the Genji swap is what they need at the end of the day, just able to be a bit more aggressive. I feel like this also plays better with the Tracer, because the Tracer does a bunch of chip damage. You go in with your uh, dash, you get that follow-up, and then you get the reset after the elimination. So a lot of just kind of quick and calculated moves and some good team coordination that help them get that point. And really nice adjustment. A lot of teams, you know, they'll bang their head against the wall constantly trying to force the competition to work. Oh, we almost have ultimates, let's just play for that. But instead they're gonna go for the stick, and it's only gonna get the immortality field really nice from Zep turn. Again, they've been on fire. She's been landing these all day. Kindred with the shatter there, but she was antsy and there was no one alive to follow up. Everybody was still looking at that pulse bomb that came out from Sunshine and that shatter is just down the drain now. And the rest of drainers, they have to go on the back foot. Yippee carry, they continue to march this cart forward off the back of just one little misplay there. And Kendra says, I've had enough playing passive. I've had enough of Reinhardt. I'm going back to the Junker Queen. We are going to run straight into them once again. But Yippee Carry, they have some things to work with here. The Blade is going to be without a Nano, but still could find quite a lot of value in the, as well as, I mean, it's going to be actually the Amatrix first, but they're going to just knock them off the high ground with the Primal Rage. That's a great Primal from Terra, but the Leaf, the Petal Platform coming out from Scarlet to lift Zepturn up into the heavens, away from the Angry Monkey. As she descends, it's now just going to be the Dragon Blade coming out from Reese's, but Kindred with a knife just shuts that one down. Despite that, though, Yippee Carry, the cart is very close, but Drainers, they're able to take control, force the rest of Yippee Carry back, and stop the cart just shy of that checkpoint. We haven't even talked about the fact that there's a Life Weaver on the field right now, but that's not even that important I, because I didn't want to Zepturn, address it. I wanted to pretend again. to ignore it as long as I could. <laughs> yeah, well, it, Life Weaver's not a real character, don't worry. I mean, Scarlet's been playing it re really well. The ultimate there comes out and gets a lot of healing out throughout the Dragon Blade, which got shut down. But again, the Immortality Field has Zepturn, she has just been landing them at the perfect time. The timing on Immortality Field is like the different, like a second can be the difference between winning a team fight and losing it. And putting, getting it out right before the blade hits, getting able, or getting your kindred, like just keeping them alive is everything. And that has just been helping them win this over and over again. Uh, speaking of great immortality fields, that was not one from Kayla. Forced out early just to try and keep themselves alive, but it's no good. Speaking of though, Reese's Feast is actually gonna take down Zepturn. So a bap for a bap, but it seems to uh, be a little bit back and forth actually. Yippee carry, they might be able to make something out of this if they can keep Sunshine alive. And Kindred says nay to that. Sunshine sent back to spawn, but no one was touching. The Reese's with a bit of a back cap there. You can see, yeah, look no. at you guys right there being like, oh no, we've done it now. And I was actually gonna comment that Kindred like had to fall from the flower petal at one point to stop Unlucky Main from capping it. But there at the last second, I mean, you've got Yves in the sky on the Echo. No one's actually on the point. Keep it carry. They're given a lifeline. They are given a bone because again, this is a first to two. This isn't an elimination match. It is Swiss. But being able to keep this map alive, potentially being able to force map three, at least getting a lot more cart progress, that is enormous. Keep it carry are gifted so much there. We'll see what they can do with it. Yeah, Reese is actually getting really close to another blade as well. And an early pickoff onto KJ means Reese is going to have plenty of time to farm for one. Kindred has to go for an aggressive rampage, but the lamp is good. And she's going to fall for it. Shun Sunshine with two big pickoffs there. And there's not really an opportunity for drainers to dig their heels into the dirt. Yippee carry, they're going to get more cart progress. And even if the cart stops here, which it very well might with those two pickoffs there, even getting the cart this far on Numbani sometimes is just as good as capping. And it's not getting out the ampli amplification matrix that's impressive because that was a needed ultimate. Zipturn had to use it there. But it's getting out the duplicate. They don't get to build up their own amp matrix. The fight's already over. Drainers had to throw out everything they had. And they're going to make some swaps now. They're going to go back 
two more of that poke style comp. Their Scarlet's gonna swap from the Life Weaver to the Ilyari, so a lot more damage output potentially if they're hitting those headshots. Uh, we're gonna see now the Genji as well instead of the Echo, but I'm really gonna be looking at Scarlet. She has to hit, like, she has to do consistent damage here. Because Dibby Carrot, they have so much to work with here. I mean, they might just end it right now. They could combo any of their DPS ultimates with the Graviton Surge, and they could just wipe the entire team. Speaking of DPS ultimates, we're gonna kick it off. There's that Graviton Surge and the Artillery Strike right on top of it, Sunshine, with a nice 2k. And KJ was coming up on the only ult that Drainers had at their disposal. She's not able to build up to it, and Yippie Carry can keep the pressure on, and they do just that. Reese's pops the blade, Zepturn is down. A couple quick quick swipes to take down Kindred, and it's only Zepturn and Yves to try and stay alive, though. KJ comes out with the overclock, but nobody is showing their face. She has to try and slide in to go for the contest, but she only has the pile on to keep her alive and it is doing a ton of work there but as it falls KJ's life is on the clock she's somehow able to slide away but it seems all but done for Yip for drainers as Yippie Carry continue to march forward that said Yves takes down Reese's and it's still a little bit touch and go Terra's down drainers they might have found a lifeline with KJ staying alive just long enough the stall is so impressive. The swap onto Doomfist. The Tracer swap as well. They do everything they need to just deny that last 1.2 meters for the full cap for Yippie Carry. And I gotta say, I think the blade was used a little bit preemptively. It was used when there was only one member alive. Save that for when the rest of Drainers is respawning. Instead, now they still have another fight to go. And this is last fight territory. They have no more time left. They do have an Ant Matrix. They the almost beast. had a sounder. Unlucky main. They fall, there's no more Lucio ultimate. That's the best possible pick you could have gotten. You still have the window coming up from Kayla, but they're gonna fall. Kindred just gonna punch right through it, has no problem breaking a few windows. The Meteor Strike gonna come down with the Captive Sun to burst down Terra. Reese's still contesting, finds two. What? Might actually be able to pull this off if they can just get rid of Kindred. The, the beat, beat is back. Unlucky main comes back and Reese's still alive, but Kindred has just so much HP. Zepturn on the Kiriko now gonna teleport in with a swift step. Falls, but they still haven't dislodged Kindred. They have to try and get rid of this Doomfist, and they just don't seem to have the resources to do it, do Yippie Ketty? And with Kayla gone, Unlucky Main goes in for a big pickoff there, but gets cleaned up, and Kindred is once again able to keep the stall alive as the rest of Drainers swarm the point and evict Yippie Carry from it. This seems to be where the cart will stop as Terra, with their last breath, is going to fall. 1.2 meters away from the cap there for Yippie Carry, but Drainers with some incredible last minute clutch stall. I think that, I mean, can you think about how this map could have gone if they hadn't given up the point? If they hadn't C9, that could have been a second point hold, but instead they give up almost everything until the very last moment. 1.2 meters separated between stalling them on second and the full point or the full capture of the map going to Yippie Carry. They gave it all they had, but Drainers. Just too good, too clean in the clutch. The spawn advantage, too much to overcome. We're gonna see some replays of exactly how this C9 came out. So, see the Echo fly. Kindred! Oh no! Oh, and. I mean, I, I, you, if you're Reese's, like. Reese's is really feeling good about that one. Like, that, that one, like, couldn't I don't have think even that was been even intentional. On purpose. Yeah, that, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that was not on purpose. They were just trying to do damage. And they're like, okay, cool. We got the point. Good job, everyone. Yeah, there's just like that little echo duel going on there, or so the echo versus the uh, the Genji there, and Kendra's like, you got this, right? Let me shout in and try and repel the rest of the team. Like, it was actually a smart play from Kendra to do that, but it was just, you know, stepping off the point, and Reese's just kind of falling, the success just kind of falling in Yippie Carry's lap there. But also think of how, like, Yippie Carry could have absolutely capped it if not for that one Widow shot onto Unlucky Main when Unlucky was about 3% away from the sound barrier. Yep, they could have gone the full cap. It wouldn't have been with a lot of time, but it would have been the full cap nonetheless. Despite that, though, still got a lot of push. Still a lot of map to play. A lot of meters to go for Drainers if they want to take the clean 2-0 and clean out or clear out the first round of this Swiss stage. And they're going to be trying to run this Sigma Poke comp once more. Have not really found any success on it. Take that high ground, see if they can do a little bit of poke. There's no Bastion this time. Um, on their side at all, so KJ gonna have to get it done with the Sojourn, which they have been doing very well, but it's gonna be Reese's! Yeah, who needs a backline when you just have sticky bombs that can just blow up your Sojourn there, and yeah, that's a lot of your damage now taken off the field, and that's gonna be... Uh, make it all the, more, all the harder to try and hold this high ground, but despite that, 
Traders with both supports alive and with Kindred up there do want to hold it, and Terra can't really contest it right now as she doesn't have a she doesn't have any any agency over this right now. They're just waiting for everything to go. Here we go. Great rock there from Kindred to take down Reese's, and once again Terra repelled. And Drainers hold this high ground, but they have to come down eventually. And they are going to do just that. Kendry going to push forward to try and make it an unsafe place for the rest of Gippy Carry to be. Unlucky main going to get quite unlucky there. A couple of those spears from Kindred. And Kindred is just charging forward with the rest of Drainers following her. That should be the cap for Drainers. And they play that so well on the side of Drainers. They don't give up the high ground despite losing one right away. They continue to hold it. And Yippie Carry is too scared. They don't want to come in. They don't want to overplay their hand. They don't want to overextend. So they just play it safe. They play the low ground. And they allow for Drainers to regroup. And I saw actually what was a very good attempt from Kayla to throw in the anti-nade. They throw it in. I don't know where it hit. It might have been too high. Maybe it hit the roof. It might have hit the Sigma shield. It just never landed. So the timing actually there from Yuppie Carry was good. Terra goes in as well as Reese's goes in off of what they assume is going to be a huge biotic nade that's going to anti everyone, make them unhealable. But it never lands. And instead, they just get blown up in that fight. They give up the first point with lots of time for Drainers to move on. And now they're taking over the second point on the map. Where is Sunshine currently lurking? Commanding Shao gonna come out from Terra. The Ant Matrix from Zep turn to try and repel the oncoming onslaught. And it does seem to have at least rerouted them. Yippee Carry gonna go through this little room over here. The Ant Ma or the Immortality Field forced out. Rally gonna come out from Scarlet and Sunshine has been plucked off in the back line by Zep turn. So no longer do the back line have to worry about that pesky little tracer pressuring them from behind. And the rest of Yippee Carry are slowly forced back as Drainers, they don't have to check their backs anymore. They can just keep on going. KJ with a nice 3k, she's going crazy there, and the night, a, a little bit of sticky bombs atop it off, Drainers, a clean team fight win. Terra just trying to take them to the wastelands, and it didn't actually go off, they get eliminated in the middle of their ultimate. That would have been the big fight winner potentially, or at least something to turn it around, and now that's going to be second point for free. They can't yeah, no contest C9 this. no C9 needed this time, no C9 needed no at C9. all, they just walk this one right in. I mean, who needs to see nine when you just win the fight that cleanly when you force them to back up? Drainers, they are absolutely asserting dominance. They're finally making the Sigma poke composition work. It is working wonders. They're going to use their Gravitic Flux, and this time oh, it is going to land. They're about to do a whole lot more than poke and a little bit of slamming back down to the earth. The Ammatrix Amat comes out, and the Immortality Field was good, but everyone from Reefy Carry, their HP is just so low, and Drainers are happy to take the last little bit there as they march the payload on towards that golden box of victory. The attack from Yippie Carry looked pretty good, a little shaky at times, but their defense, they're running out of time. I think Kendra just plays every character the same at this point. There is no S key on her keyboard, just running in on the Sigma, creating plenty of space. KJ still has the overclock, which could do tons of damage, especially because of where they're playing. They might not see it. There yeah, is going to be a sound barrier. Sound barrier is used though, so they do have the overshield. Yeah, that's gonna make it really difficult for KJ to find any purchase. She's on five HP, but just playing Ring Around the Rosie with Unlucky Main, but that takes time, and that ultimate is now down the drain. Great use of the uh, the sound barrier there from Unlucky Main, and that's gonna repel any hope of an attack that Drainers had, but Scarlet popping the rally. It looks like she wants to keep Ives and Kindred in the fight. They wanna keep the pressure up. I'm not sure how smart this is without your Baptiste there, but they can at least hold what ground they have and help and help try and keep Yippie Carry on the back foot here, playing around this corner. Echo gonna pop the duplicate there onto the tracer, going into the back line, trying to route around Yippie Carry, who seems to be seems to have flanked the drainers, but they just put themselves into this little hallway of death. The pulse bomb comes out, it's good. Kayla falls, gravitic flux from Kindred lifts them up in the sky, but they're nowhere near the card. The only one left alive to touch is Sunshine, and her life is done. That's gonna be it. Drainers take Numbani and take the series 2-0. You have to have some serious confidence to be in a 3v5 and continue to hold position, not back off the cart. They use the rally and it seems crazy at the time, but GP Carry can't jump in. There's there's too much overheal. They have too much, I would say, crowd control with the Sigma to really like, again, you don't want to overextend, you don't want to risk, you're, you know, just giving up the fight for free, but they just don't push when they have the numbers advantage. And because of that, Drainers, again, they stabilize on the cart. They run back in, they use the duplicate, they create chaos. It looks like they actually swapped who was on attack and defense. Yippie Carry was playing on the stairwell, like completely out of position for defenders, I would say there, or at least not where you'd expect to hold as a defender. And from there, it just seems like their number had been called. They put up a great fight, especially, I mean, they kept it close. Both maps, honestly, were both very, very close, came down to the wire, but Drainers 
This is why they're one of the top teams. They get that 2-0 and they start off the Swiss stage so, so strong. It, it did end up being potentially closer than I think a lot of people seeing this matchup would have initially thought. You know, all throughout though, Jimmy Carey, they held their own, they had some great plays. Zep turned constantly on point with a lot of those uh, immortality fields to help keep Kindred alive, help keep that aggression, help save, you know, help save KJ when she gets pulse bomb there, like we saw in that early replay. A couple of misplays from Drainers and a couple of weird positional routing from Gippy Carey, but the team cohesion still feels like it's there. I have a feeling that Yippie Carey still has potential to get a couple wins under their belt as we progress through the Swiss rounds here. But Drainers are going to be a team to watch out for throughout the entirety of the Swiss rounds. And if they play like this and clean up a few of those misplays, almost certainly in the playoffs. Yeah, I could see Yippie Carey as a dark horse. I could absolutely see them making the playoff stage of how they played today. I mean, they kept it close. I, I think... Especially on oh, this last point, the third point on their attack, they could have gone for the Volcat, this could have been extra rounds. Just a few things to clean up. And that's the thing about a Swiss stage, you know, you have so many games to play. Every game you get a little bit stronger, a little bit more coordinated, a little bit more in the zone. So they can keep this momentum going, even though it's a loss. You say, hey, like, look at how well we played such a good team. Drainers who are, I would say, not guaranteed necessarily, but definitely expected to be in the playoff. Like, we yeah. took them to the limit. We went 100 to 0 them on the first point of control. That is not a statement that a lot of teams can make in Calling All Heroes. So they can definitely keep it going and make that playoff push. They got at least five more rounds in the Swiss stage to make it happen. So I'm excited to see what they can do. But Drainers, again, like they are a team to watch out for. Absolutely. It's like I said, Yippie Carry, they're grinders. You can even see like Reese's Vieces here with some incredible numbers on the Genji. And time and time again was coming up with just what the the team needed to try and stay alive to try and keep the push alive to try and get that cart that last extra little bit also to get the c9 but also you know to open up fights a very key player for yippie carry and i said the, again this team is full of grinders they've been together for a long a long time reese's one of the newer players that is slotted in on this roster as of late seems to be a real boon for this team and even though they lose 2-0 here still still a team to watch out for because we're seeing improvement from this team they might not be on the outside looking in for forever but drainers not letting him in today not just yet gonna have to go through the rest of the swiss rounds to see if you're able to make it there drainers congrats on the 2-0 a great start for the swiss stage there but yeah what else is there to say what else is there to say but drainers doing what was expected of them and yippee carry looking pretty solid but not quite there we can hear exactly what Drainers has to say in just a few moments. We'll be doing an interview with one of their players. Before that, we're going to be taking a short break. We're going to hear folks because we have that interview coming up just after that.
Welcome back, everybody. We have Lane from Drainers joining us here for an interview. Yeah, one of their uh, substitute players, but still definitely a key part of their success. Lane, I want to go ahead and hit you with an easy question right out of the gate. How does it feel to be back for another Calling All Heroes tournament? Um, yeah, it's great. I like playing, even though I'm not playing right now. You know, it's uh, it's great. I like to compete. I'm sure the other people like to compete, but I haven't really spoken to them yet this weekend, so, you know. Well, competing your team is thus far. You guys come off a 2-0 victory. However, a bit of a close one. Um, I mean, I gotta ask, like, what are your opinions on how um, Oasis went, especially, like, losing that first sub-map 0-100? to uh, I don't know. I didn't really watch the map, so... <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know. Just, just like, uh, just guess. Just like, just like, uh, imagine what happened and give us your feedback. All right. Well, I, I'm gonna imagine that we trolled because we're. That's probably we're like pretty that. true, actually. I, I, I. All right. Well, you know, and then end of the day, we won the map, and that's all that really matters. So, yeah. It's true. I mean, I gotta say, I think the mental fortitude from you know losing a sub map like that to come back and then two one and then also get. 100 zero on the third one is very very good it's very strong mental fortitude um i gotta ask you know you guys drainers as a whole are one of the top teams i would say in calling all heroes at the moment are there any teams that you're looking forward to playing at throughout this tournament or just watching your team play uh uh valiant because last time we we like lost to them but that was kind of fraud watch that wasn't really real that that didn't happen and this time they don't have extent to carry them and halo as well so it's kind of different you know so uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm gassed to go against them. All right, all right. Calling them out a little bit ahead of time. Hopefully we do get to see that match. And you know, oh, you know I, I actually, honestly, I hope that we uh, we get to see you slotted in there to get a little bit of uh, your taste of things there. Are you? Uh, are there any other teams that you're looking forward to playing? Or are you just dead set on uh, Face and Valiant Guardians making it all the way to the playoffs? I don't know what other teams are in the tournament. I haven't checked the page, so. <laughs> you love to see it, okay. Well, I mean, hey, welcome to welcome to the <laughs> welcome to the tournament. I'm glad to have you guys here. It's a pleasure to get to see trainers playing at this level. I'm glad to have you be a part of it, and hopefully, we do get to see more of you going forward. But that's going to be it for our interview. That's uh, a <laughs> pleasure to have a uh, pleasure to have you joining us, Lane. Thank you very much. Unless there's uh, anything else you want to say, uh, Drain Gang, I'm sim I'm single. DM me on Twitter one three three seven Sammy. Uh, hit my line. All right. Thanks for having me on the interview, GGs. 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 That was, uh, you know, I've never seen someone use a shout out for that. Usually it's like, ah, oh, family, friends, um, yeah. you know, uh, my team. But uh, the Riz game is strong, I must say. You know, if, you, if you're going to go out like that, you know, your sub coming off the bench didn't get to play, didn't even watch the first map, and you're just going for it. I respect it. That's just confidence in your team. Like, I don't even need to watch. Like, I just know they got this. And, like, you know, a little bit of like, yeah, being like, yeah, we probably trolled. Like knowing knowing some of the players on this team, like I'm good friends with Scarlet and Kindred. Yeah, they do a little bit of trolling sometimes. It happens. It, it, it happens to all of us. But if you can still win the map and get away with it, GG's. But we're going to go ahead and look forward. That was a, a fun little interview. We're going to go ahead and move forward and uh, yeah, throw to a quick little break. We'll be right back with round two on the other side of this. Don't go anywhere.
Welcome back, everybody, to Calling All Heroes, the Toronto Defiant Rise Together Minor 3. I am CB, joined by Jag, and we have a very, very high, well, a high octane matchup set up for the Swiss round two. We're right in the middle of the Swiss rounds, but before we get to that, let's have a quick little look at the standings, see how everyone's performing, see uh, where things are shaking out after that first round of wins and losses. Yeah, I think the most interesting thing is that Valiant Guardians and oh yes, despite getting that first round win, did struggle, had to go to that map three, had to go all the way to push to get the job done. Not something you'd exactly expect, especially from Valiant Guardians, who are one of the top teams at this event, finished second at the last event. But overall, I would say it's about what I'd expect. I mean, we haven't seen GRE Nightmare just yet. They did get a buy. One team gets or at least at least one team gets a buy every round just because we have an odd number of teams here at this event. But other than that, I, I think this is about what I would expect after the first round of the Swiss stage. There's a, there's a couple teams down there in the lower end, like Bad Blood or Azathoth, that you might expect to be a little bit higher. But, you know, we're, we're only one round in, and sometimes your first Swiss round doesn't go as planned. You get a slow start, or you get to go up against the Washington Timeless or a Valiant Guardians or potentially a Drainers, and it just doesn't pan out. But... There's still plenty of time to shape up, which makes it all the more interesting that we're going to kick things off with Washington Timeless versus Valiant Guardians as our next game, a potential playoff finals caliber matchup, and we're getting it in Swiss round two. I mean, this is one heck of a banger matchup right out of the get-go. Second round, and we're getting the two teams that were finalists in the last minor. The, not only in the grand finals, but also in the upper bracket final. And I mean, there's some tea there. Uh, Valiant Guardians actually knocked Washington Timeless to that lower bracket, and then Washington Timeless beat them in that grand final. So these two teams have, you know, been sharing blows. They've been taking maps, series off each other. There's no real, I would say, favorite coming out of the gate, which is what makes this so exciting. And uh, like, this is not just for like, obviously you want to go as undefeated as you can in the Swiss stage, but there's so much more at stake. This is for pride. This is for bragging rights. And this could be for momentum later on when they eventually were assuming uh, rematch in that playoff bracket. And this match, it's an onion, right? There's layers to this because not only is it a playoff caliber match, not only have these two teams met before, not only have they traded blow for blow, they've also traded a couple of players. We have players like Halo who previously played for Valiant Guardians now playing on Washington Timeless, I believe as a starting position on that roster. You have, you know, Washington Timeless making some new changes. You have Valiant Guardians also making some roster changes, but a lot of the core pieces of both of these teams are still in play and still just as dangerous and just as deadly as they've ever been. And I mean, we might just be getting a little bit of a preview of what the grand finals of this tournament ends up looking like. I, I fully expect both of these teams to make it to playoffs. So be on the lookout for these two teams to get an early, uh, you know, like you said, bragging rights, just a little bit of a get one over on the other one. We haven't seen a lot of all chat yet, but like, I, I just want to see the all chat fly. I want to see the, <laughs> ha, we beat you earlier yeah. on. You know, we beat you in round two of Swiss. We gotcha. like, can't beat us now. Yeah, it's GG's, it's over. It doesn't matter if we see you again later on, but we're going to see exactly what those lineups look like. And I know you hinted at it just a little bit, but there is Hell Halo in the starting lineup. And I mean, this is a player absolutely look out for. Uh, I love the Sniper also. They put Mercy as their favorite player, as well as Nosler, you know, just, we're, we got a lot of Mercy lovers out I, here as, again, you can get their skin by watching the stream, but I think Halo is like the big name to look out for. A uh, former Overwatch League player, uh, was just recently on New York Excelsior previously, but before that, the Boston Uprising as well. Um, and now that they swap teams, like this could like really tilt this, like I would say rivalry in their favor. I do love me a little bit of tank mercy. That's my preferred way of playing mercy is to, to front line, run take as them. much damage as possible. Yeah, <laughs> run out just with the, the blaster out, trying to do as much damage as possible before my short life expires. I don't think that's what Sniper's gonna be played. They're known a little bit more as one of the better Sigmas in all of Washington Timeless, or sorry, in, in all of Calling All Heroes, but for Washington Timeless, they're gonna be a huge boon. They've had such a successful run with this roster. And if Sigma is shaping out to be a little bit more and more meta, like we saw from the grand finals of Florida Mayhem at Overwatch League, like we saw Drainers hint at just a little bit, like I said, trying on that new pair of shoes. This could be a very dangerous roster. And Snozlar and Bun as a DPS core, definitely nothing to sneeze at. There's a lot of talent on this roster. And I'm just curious to see how the addition of Halo shapes this whole, rounds this whole roster out. 
I feel like New York Excelsior Academy is the gift that just keeps on giving to other teams. It was such a stacked lineup. They were one of the favorites in Calling All Heroes, and Bun now moving over to that roster. We're going to see what she can do. I mean, she's one of the best DPS in the scene by far. We got to cast her during Throne of uh, Defiant Pride Cup a few months ago, yeah. and she was absolutely fragging out in that one. But now Valiant Guardians, we're going to see what they bring to the table moving Fish 7. One of my favorite tanks, and not only Calling All Heroes, but all of Collegiate. Love seeing what they do on Redbirds. I actually got to cast them on land for the Intel Inspires Collegiate Championship just a few months ago. Uh, I don't think they took the W there, but still, they played out of their mind. And again, like, this is another lineup. Like, Whips, also very talented in that hit scan role. Yeah, he's a pretty great hit scan player, and if given space to to make some plays with there, can be one to watch out for, might be popping up on the kill feed from time to time. And again, I like that you bring up Moving Fish, a well-known player from that Redbirds roster, was typically slotted into that roster to play some of the off-tank roles, which I think makes it kind of interesting because Moving Fish also was typically slotted in, you know. Back in the day when they were playing for Redbirds, off-tank basically meant you come in to play Sigma on Circuit Royale. So. Sigma might be like the key thing that both of these players, you know, Moving Fish versus Sniper, that they're going to try and bust out. And, you know, we'll see who gets the better of it, or we'll see if I'm just completely wrong and one of these other players has something better that they have in their back pocket that they want to come out here with. But regardless, that's the head-to-head -head that I want to see. But you can look at any position on either of these rosters and pick the head-to-head, -head, and it's probably going to be a banger either way. Support for support, DPS for DPS, hit scan for hit scan. Where do you even begin? I think we've got to talk about coaches really quickly. I mean, Lep, now the coach of Valiant Guardians, I do not believe that they were the coach at the time of their last matchup uh, during the Washington Justice Minor. So this is a whole new mindset. You know, coaches can completely change up strategy. It's also, you know, there's a little bit of a difference in the support lineup as we talked about Halo moving from Valiant Guardians to Washington Timeless. But I, I really want to see what Lep does, how, you know, these compositions are molded because, you know, as a former player for New York Excels here for the Houston Outlaws, they have a lot of experience at the highest level of play. And that brings a lot of knowledge into that coaching role. So that could actually be the biggest difference here today. Yeah, the coaching staff, the management staff on both of these teams is also an integral part of their success. And I'm looking forward to seeing what they've all cooked. You know, what's really sad is that both of these teams can't have flawless Swiss stages because we have this matchup here. One of them is going to have a blemish on their record, at least one, because there's still four rounds after this that they could potentially amass another loss or two. You know, again, with teams like Drainers waiting in the wings, you never know. That team did, in fact, best both of these teams in that Kunoichi kerfuffle between the last minor and now, but that does not mean that these two teams are not deadly, are not dangerous. We'll see who the more deadly of the two is when we go in to our first map here. Yeah, and it is going to be Lijong Tower. Again, this was predetermined already. Uh, next round is going to be Antarctic Peninsula if you want a little sneak peek at that. But here on Lijong Tower, I think this one is going to be very, very interesting. I feel like Lijong Tower is one of the control maps where it has kind of the most unique set of compositional play styles. Like, I feel like each kind of sub map plays a little bit differently. A control center, very brawl centric. We've seen a lot of Symmetra on, I'm just going to call it Market because it really depends on you know the map filter and the day filter night now day, night market yeah. date market yeah one, one of the two i feel like yeah, it's kind of more of a poke comp and then garden has always been a bit dive heavy but as we've seen these teams you know on the bonnie in the last series didn't really do that much dive there was some attempts but overall it was a lot of poke a lot of brawls what we saw and i'm curious to see if that trend continues we are going to be starting on day market it is the day so that will yeah. give us a really nice sneak peek of i mean i'm expecting sigma comps like i'm expecting like Either like they TP through and try to set up on point, or maybe they just try to fight out kind of in the courtyard, um, away from the point. But I'm expecting Sigma. Yeah, I, I, I've talked at ad nauseum and will continue to do so until everyone is sick of me about the prevalence of Bastion in the current climate of competitive Overwatch. And, you know, both of these teams are going to be teams that are ahead of the curve, that are at the forefront of that, playing what is best for them. And you're know, looking at Washington Timeless, this looks like exactly the kind of composition that I would expect. That's that Florida Mayhem composition, though, with the May there. Valiant Guardians, I don't know how I feel about coming out here with a Doomfist, though. It can work. I mean, especially with the Farah Pharmacy, like you create chaos. The Pharmacy just rains down from above. One thing that I forgot to mention is that Aramori actually isn't able to play uh, this week. So this is a bit of a different maybe supporting lineup that Valiant Guardians would want to run in general. 
Um, so they might be trying to play some more comfort picks, like maybe they want to go for the pharmacy because they prefer Mercy, just with who they're running here. So, you know, making those adjustments, we'll have to see if it works well. There, I, I, It can work, but they can't get run up on. Like, if the Sigma gets too much space or the Bastion gets too much space, like, there's not much Valiant Guardians can do, but they get the first pick. Yeah, that's uh, quite a bit of value right there. Chisato with a nice two-piece there. Takes down Bun as well with the, the Mercy Pocket from Caro playing dividends, but she flies a little bit too close to the sun, and Orion is more than happy to make that Icarus fall back down to Earth. But that said, Valiant Guardians, even despite losing Chisato in that fight, look to take this first point pretty cleanly. She gets res right back up, and this is where I'm a little bit worried for Washington Timeless. They don't have a true hitscan player except for Orion on the Baptiste. I, I do like these swaps. They're actually going to swap the Diva, which can just kind of fly up into the pharmacy. But Bun and Snozzler, yeah, yes, hit scan technically, but they're such short range hit scan, they really won't be able to deal with this Farah in the sky. So it's going to be up the True Moon to continue to run into them, or they might just try to avoid them completely, take the objective. Valiant Guardians, they got to make a move or they might get this up for free. Yeah, they're playing a very scattershot composition where they want to be all over the place and try and swarm Washington Timeless. And Washington Timeless have fallen right into that trap and they're going to lose Halo as a result there. That's a great early pickoff there. A lot of the speed, a lot of the maneuverability now taken off the field, as will the rest of the team be if Chisato has anything to say about it. She's on the hunt and still has that pocket mercy. Caro actually does get cleaned up there. So that pocket mercy now off the field, but doesn't really matter because I think enough work has already been done for Valiant Guardians to hold on tight to not only the point, but to a full house of ultimates. And this stagger on a true move is so impressive. Jisato does get hacked out, but she's able to run away. They're gonna have everything, including Nano, in just a few moments. Valiant Guardians are playing this to perfection. I really think they need a Cassidy and Ash. Maybe even a Soldier 76, just something that's a little bit more long range CPS because Shisato's just running around for free right now. And as long as Valiant Guardians don't use like everything here, they should be able to still win the next two fights on ultimates alone. I mean, speaking of ultimates, here comes a Nano potentially with a barrage, but don't even need it. Halo gets a little bit too close to Shisato again, and the Rocket's just gonna take that Lucio out. I mean, I don't even know if Halo's gonna have a chance to build up to a sound barrier this entire match here, but Washington Timeless, they find the flip there, but doesn't really matter. Moving Fish is taken down too, and like another easy hold coming out for Valiant Guard, or not hold, but it's gonna be a flip. 16% for Washington Timeless. That's gonna be a little bit annoying and prevent this from going into one fight territory, but now that's about where we are. I mean, they actually have a chance to win this now. That flip could be huge. The EMP is ready to go, but oh, they no. lose the Kitsune Rush. Orion is taken offline. That is disastrous. They still uh, do have you know, potential to stall out for a bit, especially self-destruct, you get on the point, you just use it there, and then you get the remake. So there are win cons still, even without the Kasumi rush, but they gotta move quickly. Yeah, EMP gonna come out from Bun, and they do take down Moving Fish, they do also have presence on the points, so they might actually be able to find the flip there, that's a great heads up EMP there, and a nice back cap there from Snozzler, and Washington Timeless, with the aid of the EMP, do seem to be winning the fight. Sombra you know, hasn't had that rework yet, doesn't have Virus, so... You know, Valiant Guardians don't have to worry about Bonzi Buddy being stalled on their computer, but they do have to worry about Orion and Trumu going in deep there. Chisato making a swap over onto the Genji. Yeah, the, it was just, you know, it was just for fun. I mean, that was definitely on purpose to just get rid of the ultimate because it looks like the whole team is making a swap. Everyone has swapped, so they've completely changed this composition around. But I, I have to wonder, they had ultimates at their disposal still, and now they have nothing. Washington Timeless have completely flipped the script. It's 99 to 46, and now they have everything in their disposal. And you can see already they're going to be using that Kitsune Rush. The full spawn from Snozzler goes wide, though, but a nice the 2k boop. there from Halo. The boop taking down Maven and Wisps, and that is a great way to kick off this fight. 60% for Washington Timeless and counting as they just mop the floor with Valiant Guardians. A great play from Halo. And, and this felt personal. I was gonna say, Halo actually felt like she was getting targeted early on. I noticed she was falling a lot. Oh, she definitely was. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's your, you know, that's my ex teammate. I gotta show them up now. Gonna make them wish they were still playing for us. But that sound wave, the double sound wave, gets two poops right off the map. That is a huge fight win. And they still have self destruct. They still have sound barrier. They're gonna use sound barrier to go aggressive. Yeah, super, super aggressive. And that looked like it might have been another boop there, but doesn't quite get any much of anything. That said, though, Meemin pops that uh, immortality field that's gonna fall. Carol gets the better of Halo in that exchange, but Sniper gonna go ahead and invest that self-destruct. It's just gonna mount to a whole bunch of charge there for Moving Fish, who is 
trying to beam down anything that dares show space, but Orion with a nice little kunai headshot there. We're at 99.98, but Chisato on the Genji is finally paying dividends, and Valiant Guardians, they flip the point, they've taken it, and it's just Orion to try and contest. Halo goes in for the touch, but Orion dies to the swift step there, and Halo to the blade. Valiant Guardians in a close one are going to take day market. That was only one sub map. I feel like we just went through all of Lee Jong Tower of how back and forth, how close that was. I want four maps of this. Give me the tiebreaker. This is exactly why these two teams were in the last grand finals. They play to each other so well. Washington Timeless with an insane comeback, but Valiant Gardens make the swap. It was such a risk, but a calculated race. They did the math, CB, and the numbers came out in their favor. The comp swap, it takes a while to build those ultimates, but they get them just in time for that last fight. And it is such a difference maker, such a well-read change that they made that could have not, you know, that could have gone horribly wrong for another team that maybe isn't as disciplined, isn't as well prepared, but they take that first sub map. Now we're moving to Gardens. They're going to be going actually for a Jugger Queen and True Move is going to be bringing out uh, Doomfist themselves. I'm interested to see that Halo is not going to be going back to the Lucio because this feels like the Lucio map here on, on Li Zhang Tower, but instead opting for the Brig, and I think they might have expected Valiant Guardians to come out with a Doomfist of their own and try and play a little bit of counter dive. I'm curious if any swaps are going to happen as the two teams are still just kind of in the poke phase right now, not really engaging all that much. Sniper going in to try and bait out a little bit of cooldowns and see if there's an opportunity to go in a little bit more aggressive, but Valiant Guardians have their feet firmly planted on the point and no one from Washington Timeless is primed to dislodge them just yet. Sniper goes in again, pops up the power block and not getting a whole lot of damage there. Gets that power up punch, but goes a little bit wide. And yeah, this should be Valiant Guardians cap in the first point here. Well, surely, right? But Sniper able to get out. They do get bun and the point goes away. So it's a 4v4, a huge anti on the point that forces out in the mortality field. But, oh, I mean, this is so back and forth right now. You yeah, I mean, the, the fact that Trumu's able to stay alive is kind of everything there. If you had lost them, you wouldn't have been able to go back in, but they do go back in, and that is a lot of players onto one moving fish feeling quite out of water there, and as might be Washington Timeless starting to uh, make a case for flipping the point here. Some nice sticky bombs from Bun and the follow-up there to take down Caro, and yeah, this is looking like all Washington Timeless in the kill feed right now. The flip comes through, only 28% to kick it off for Valiant Guardians. They swapped from the Jugger Queen to the Zarya right away. It was just using the shaft to get out of spawn a little bit more movement speed. The Zarya into the Doomfist is a very interesting matchup, and I'm honestly not sure who wins. I think if you have your bubbles, generally the Zarya, like you can stop like the CC, the crowd control from coming through of the punch. But you can see that like Sniper's just living for free, just able to get out of some insane situations. And that's a big part of why Washington Timeless are able to win that one out. Now they have a lot of ultimates at their disposal. The immortality field is thrown out again really early on, and so is the sound barrier. Hero with a nice boop there onto Snozzler. That's a great opening there for Valiant Guardians after all the ults that they invested to try and come through here. It's got to amount to a little bit more though because the more this, the longer this fight takes, the more percentage Valiant Gar or Washington Timers are going to get. The Dragon Blade comes out from Bun and Trumu goes in for a nice little two piece. And despite the investment from Valiant Guardians, Washington Timeless holds strong. It's very expensive though. The dramatic pause leads up to an epic fight and they use three ultimates there. It takes a lot for Washington Timeless to sustain there. The guards are actually in a great spot. They have the Graviton Surge as well as the Blade ready to go. So as long as they can lock down a few people, there's no immortality build that can really stop them from getting a lot of value immediately. They're going to use the Overclock to try to create some distance, maybe, uh, get some damage in. It's not going to really amount to much besides stalling, killing some time off the clock, which is better than nothing. But the Night Guardians, like, they gotta go for this fight now quickly now that that's offline. And they're gonna do just that. Graviton Surge comes out. Wisp with a nice two-piece right into that. And Chisato has the blade if she needs it. But Snozzler takes her down. And Valiant Guardians, despite losing that one, don't have a whole lot of players left. They can stall this out to 99. But Trumu's life is on the clock. Not going to last all that much longer. 96 is where it stops. And Valiant Guardians flip the point back in their favor. And that's such a good discipline. Like, my thought is use the blade, confirm that fight when move the Graviton Surge. They just use the Graviton Surge, and that's it. They just go in aggressively. They have a very high uh, charged moving fish who's just running in at them with the primary fire as well as the alternate fire. And they're able to get a huge blade flank. <laughs> what, a, 
one what? on Dragon Blade there. That one was just for Snozzler. But with that out of the way, Bun takes down Wisp. We have a little bit of a DPS for DPS trade, but you got to think that with the positioning, that's going to favor Valiant Guardians. They also have support ultimates if they need to withstand. But Bun melts down Chisato, and there wasn't a sound barrier or an uh, immortality field to try and keep her alive. And now Washington Timeless, they have a way in. Sound barrier comes out from Carol, but it doesn't catch much of anything. It's definitely not enough to save Meeman, who's going to fall. Sniper going in deep, but a little bit of a trade support for support with Halo still alive to keep Washington Timeless up in the fight. Meteor Strike comes down just to keep Sniper alive. It's still so back and forth, but this favors Valiant Guardians as long as they're able to keep it going. But Washington Timeless, they get the flip, and at 96%, there has to be a touch. Can anybody come in? It's not going to be moving fish, especially if Halo has anything to say about it. She pops the rally. So much over health, so much to chunk through, and I don't think it's going to be enough for Valiant Guardians to chunk through. This is going to be Washington Timeless holding strong on Gardens. Halo showing her old team who is boss right there. I, I don't know if we have an angle of it, but I'm pretty sure that they just used the whip flail straight into moving fish as they were trying to jump across the barrier with their punch, knock them straight into the water, let them sleep with the fishies, and then the rally on top of that, the sustain with the over health, as well as the shield bash actually hitting a stun in the ultimate form. Just all Halo all the time in that last engagement helps them force now what is going to be our third point of control it's gonna be control center yep here it is yeah you, if you if you know the there enemy you know exactly what they're gonna try and pull and halo was not born yesterday she knows that <laughs> team well she knows exactly what moving fish wanted to go for there and said no we're holding strong this is a washington timeless point here and hopefully so will be control center as they go back to that sigma composition that didn't work out too well for them on night market and Valiant Guardians are pulling out the uh, the Boston Uprising comp from playoffs, running that Orisa, maybe expecting a Rhine or a Junker Queen they can run into. It's going to be a Sigma, which I think makes this a little bit more difficult to execute, but you can still play very aggressively and in their face. Yeah, Moving Fish with the spear spinning there. The, the wall, wall, though, they might get caught the up, and they do. That's such a great wall there from Bun, and that's going to be enough to melt down Moving Fish, and the rest of Valiant Guardians have to be on the back foot. They're scattered as Washington Timeless just march forward and should take the first cap here almost for free. One cooldown, one dead tank, one easy capture. And that takes so much for Moving Fish. Aris is one of the best tanks in the game at survival. Valiant Guardians have to swap to match. Yeah, they do. They have to go for a made themselves. They're still going to stick with the Orisa, so they're probably going to try to use it as a counter wall more so than as an engagement wall. If they get caught off, uh, like that, exactly, like they get caught off by the wall, so they're going to use it to create separation. But now they finally get some push in. Orion, though, very close to the Ant Matrix. I'm gonna, assuming it's going to fly momentarily as soon as they get it online. It's very difficult for Washington and Timeless to try and play into this because you have Moving Fish just moving right at you like a snowplow with those javelins and with those Amp Matrix coming out for Meeman, you're gonna go ahead and match it, but Snozzler with the early pick off there onto Wisps and Valiant Guardians are falling left and right. That Amp Matrix not getting them a whole lot of purchase and that's another easy fight win for Washington and Timeless. Shield beat spinny thing. That's all I'm gonna say. The Sigma shield is so huge in this scenario, as well as the kinetic grass. You eat a bunch of damage, and sure, I mean, Wimarissa, you can do that as well, but it's just not nearly as much. Wisp just doesn't have that same sort of safety net, that same tank to really protect them as much. Usually, Moving Fish is gonna be going in all the time. They don't have that same protection. It's gonna be now the artillery oh, strike combo. coming out, as well as the Gravitic Flux. It's such a lethal combo. We'll see if it finds much of anything. Caro pops the sound barrier to try and make sure that it doesn't, but Chisato was just a little bit too low, and Halo cleaned that one right up. Bun not gonna let Moving Fish get out. 70% and counting, and Valiant Guardians have yet to find a way to get in the door, because Washington Timeless just keeps slamming it right back in their face. Oh, that would, could have been a great dagger on the true or a first, great first pick over extension if they were able to get that but instead they're gonna have to find a way to the point 15 seconds they got to speed through this and hope they can get as many people there they're gonna uh, hello? find the bastion snozzler what are you doing my friend wisp just gonna go ahead and melt down snozzler but that was a blizzard invested for just that kill but i think to get rid of the bastion that is probably worth it is that's gonna really hinder washington timeless's ability to take space and speaking of taking space valiant guardians are gonna do just that force the remnants of washington timeless back flip the point in their favor. Amp Matrix coming out from Orion to try and keep the fight alive, but having flipped the point, they have to be swift here. 
the Terra Surge comes out for Moving Fish. It does a lot of damage, but not as much as True Mood does in return. But Wisps still alive, still kicking, and still kicking Washington Timeless off the point. You only have this Sigma and Halo just trying to keep True Mood alive, not able to do so. Valiant Guardians have finally staked their claim and gotten on the board. Shizato dedicates the Blizzard to only one member, but if you can get the elimination off of that, it's worth. I think a lot of people, like, overestimate, like, the value that, like, Earth Shatter or Blizzard, like, these AoE abilities need to get. If you can lock down one kill and win the fight off of that, that is all you need. And there, they do it to perfection. Another it was wall. desperate times. It's even more desperate times. They lose Moving Fish. Again, Bun sets up her team it, for just amazing fight wins. It's such a good wall. Chisato has to go for one as well, but it's just not the same. It just doesn't work out. And the rest of Tawashin and Timeless just going to march forward and completely evict Valiant Guardians from the point. Aside from that one little fight there, Control Center was all Washington Timeless all the time. They never once, well, only once, but nearly never once took their foot off the gas firmly in the driver's seat the whole time and Washington Timeless run it back and take Li Zhang Tower two to one. What a performance. You said, hopefully it's their map. It was definitely their map. Yeah, they give up the point. I mean, they give up 50%, which is honestly more than they probably should have because that flip happened way before that fight ended. But other than that, very flawless. They had a strategy of using that Maywall and Bun executed it to absolute perfection i mean every time they needed a wall to cut off moving fish it was there and every time they were able to cut off moving fish moving fish died it's just that simple it's a two-step plan and it was just every time it worked out that was i mean that was the game plan for washington timeless it was just put up the wall and push go but when the game plan didn't go according to plan it was halo that actually ended up being the clutch player for washington timeless that helped win them some very key points on Li Zhang tower what a steal to take halo from valiant guardians bring her to your own roster and then come out with those big boops like that you know we're obviously looking at her getting you know direct impacted by chisato's rockets but as soon as she was given the opportunity to clap back, she went absolutely massive. Shouts out to Halo for that one, but all of Washington Timeless for just having it all together on Li Zhang Tower. If they keep up this tempo, can Valiant Guardians you know, find their way back into this series, or is Washington Timeless just primed to run away with this one? I think there's plenty of opportunities for them to get back to this. I'm expecting Flashpoint at the very least. Like I was thinking before, give me push, give me map four. I could absolutely see it happening. But we got to get there first. I think the biggest thing for Valiant Guardians is it seems like they had a lot of different comps up their sleeves. I mean, both teams did. Washington Timeless as well pulled out a few different looks. But that Pharmacy was not something I expected to see whatsoever. The Farah Mercy in the sky did so much for that first point. And even when they swapped comps, like they already had 99%. We didn't really see that same sort of, I would say, perfection right out the gate like later on. Like we didn't see them be able to just like take the first cap, take that first fight win. It seemed like they really struggled outside of having that pharmacy. So I'd love to see them get a little bit weird with it, try to go for some more funky sort of stuff that's like more in their wheelhouse, because that was a really big reason why they were able to win out on um, day market from the get-go. And it seems like on Control Center, on Guardians, uh, not as much success. And I, I was actually really surprised they didn't run the pharmacy on Guardians. I feel like that's a great map for it. We see a lot of time you go for like that bridge play where you try to knock them off. Um, with the boop ability that she has, but none of that like, ever came into our screens. It's it's interesting. If we want to talk about like compositions, I did like the Doomfist look from Valiant Guardians with the Farmer C, but there might not be a whole lot of other maps where you can realistically get away with that. And I'm a little bit worried because when it came down to what we kind of expect the meta to fall into currently, again, that that grand finals championship winning Florida Mayhem composition, Washington Timeless looked a lot more well versed in it. They seem to have the pieces together. They're playing that Sigma to perfection. They've got the, uh, you know, they got the Bastion, the May, and even the Sojourn looks that they can throw in there. And you can have a look at the Bastion play coming out on uh, on either side here. It was definitely Snozzler getting the better of Wisps there. Not by much, but especially when you get down to the bottom of that list there, the eliminations and the eliminations per 10. Good Lord, the elims per 10 Snozzler was putting in there. Oh my goodness. There. Wait, wait, what? What? What am I looking at? I don't think I've ever seen eliminations per 10 that high, but I mean, it's not just the tank. We talked about the tank not having fun with Bastion. No one's having fun in this lobby except the Bastion player when they are just putting out 
that much misery and damage and eliminations. J J I mean, it's it's eliminations. It's not final blows. But when you're pumping out that much damage as a Bastion and things are falling left and right, of course, you're going to be uh, padding your elimination stat there just a little bit. And I think Snozzler might have a chance to continue to do just that. Because like I said, you know, Washington Timeless... They have this really, really strong composition that they seem to be better versed in than Valiant Guardians. And you can even see when Valiant Guardians tried to mirror it for their own their own sake, they went with the Orisa variation of it, which, you know, like you said, Boston Uprising tried that as well, but it didn't work out for them in the end. It wasn't quite good enough. And when you're playing like Washington Timeless is, it's a tough nut to crack. It's so difficult to overcome. It's like that Ryan Rush comp, but you just can't get close to it because the Sigma gives you more range. Yeah, Commander X, uh, one of the coaches for Spitfire, made a really good video kind of de describing um, how the Orisa comp is better than the Ryan comp, and it's like, like you just play corners better, but it doesn't matter how many corners you play better if there is a Maywall in your way, and, you know, even Wave Golden, even with the spin to win ability that Orisa has, just can't escape, just didn't have enough survivability, and now Washington Timeless, they are up one through, which means Valiant Guardians. It's gonna be their map pick for number zero, and... We're going back to Nimbani. This seems to be a favorite so far at Calling All Heroes, at least what we've seen so far on stream. All the teams want to play this, and I'm expecting more of the same of what we saw before. I think we're going to see a lot of Sigma once again. Potentially. So that might, uh, so this might be the same question as last time, where I was like, you know, maybe they want to play some of the dive compositions, but is that a trap? And it very well might be, because we saw Moving Fish come out with a Doomfist, and it kind of worked. We saw Shisato on the Farah, and it kind of worked with the Mercy Pocket. We see a lot of Echo, we see a lot of dive compositions on Numbani. This could be something that Valiant Guardians have up their sleeve, something that can play to their actual strengths here. But I do also kind of want to caution again, you know, when you have Snazar on that Bastion, when you have as much of a lethal composition as, uh, as Washington Timeless does on that high ground, especially if they're going to go for the Sigma variation again, it's not going to be any easier to crack. You have to try and leverage your flyers and try and leverage your dives and hopefully the Doomfist to displace the Sigma, get him off of that high ground, bait out the accretions and go in and take space that way. But it's not like it's it's not easy. Like I'm describing it as like as though it's easy. It's not easy. It's just like riding a bike. Easy peasy. Anyone can do it. But I think you bring up a great point, which is kind of like, do you play for dislodging them, which is more of what you try to do for dive or you try to take over that high ground? which is more of like the Pope comp. Like you literally just like play a Sigma, you like just run and say, hey, this is our high ground now. We're like Winston, Doomfist, Diva, even Wrecking Ball we've seen in past um, Calling All Hero Miners trying to like play this uh, first plane of them, Bonnie. You're just really trying to get them to move and force them into uncomfortable spots, whether it's the high ground or you force them to rotate to the other high ground all the way across. You know, whatever the way it is, that's kind of like the two different trains of thought you have here. And whatever composition you run is really going to determine how you actually play that out. I, I, I think... I think you have to opt for the dive here because poke versus poke, it seems like Washington Timeless are more well-versed, but you know, I might be eating my words here because it is attacker spawn and I don't necessarily want to take the bait, but that looks like a pretty coherent team composition to me. One very similar to the one Washington Timeless is running, but I want to go ahead and highlight Halo right now because we're seeing a little bit of Ilyari here. Yeah, Ilyari, I mean, that's also very interesting because Halo more known as a main support player and I feel like Ilyari kind of goes more into that flex support role. Uh, very heavily aim intensive, not saying that main supports can't aim, but you know, just kind of just not generally the hero they get to play. But this is a great time to flex that aim. I mean, if you hit headshots, if you get those dinks, Alari is so useful. And I mean, that healing pylon, you put it in a nice little safe nook, it's going to get so much healing over time. The one thing I'm worried about is that there's so much speed for Valiant Guardians. With that Lucio, they can just run at you. And then Iliari, I mean, she can kind of just dance away. She does have that jumping ability that also knocks you back. But like, this is what they mean. They can just run right into them. Yeah, the speed, good lord. Orion never saw it coming, and Snozzler, I mean, you never saw the second one coming. Valiant Guardians, who, who even needs the poke composition? This is more of a haymaker, just a punch straight to the teeth. They knock all of all of Washington Timeless's veneers out, and that should be a pretty swift point cap. Every composition is brawl if you wanted to. As long as you have Lucio's <laughs> speed boost to help you get to where you need to go, you can just fly right into theirs. They had no idea it was coming. And now Halo, they did get an elimination, so definitely they could have made the Ilyari work, but I think they see like, hey, like we're gonna get run over. So she's gonna make that swap right away. She's gonna now go to, you know, I, I think the right choice here. So now they can either re like they can engage aggressively themselves or they can use it as a disengage to run away. These Valiant Guardians, they already have the amplification matrix. So they're gonna need that speed boost to run away, potentially if it's used right around this corner. I'm wondering though how Washington Timers are going to play this. Like, where are they actually going to set up? Because I mean, Street Space is not nearly as optimal for a Sigma poke as it is 
you know, as is point A. You can see the walls coming out from Bun, but it's not really able to isolate moving fish. The street's just a little bit too wide. They're able to just they slide right out behind them. Meanwhile, Snipery is in no man's land right now, getting just focused by everyone, able to, again, kind of slip out there with the Ant Mage that's coming out from Meeman. You don't want to stick around all that much longer. That's a lot of hurt that's going to be coming through that window there. Chisato cleans up a kill onto Bun, and there goes the ability to segment off any members of Valiant Guardians as Washington Timeless are still on the back foot, and Ant Mage is of their own to try and stave off some of the pressure, and taking down Wisps is a great way to release that pressure valve just a little bit. Chisato going to fall as well and Valiant Guardians might have stalled out a little bit here as Washington Timeless take control. That's an insane hold. The fact that they get that defense despite being completely split after losing one, it just seems like they're able to get Wiss and then Chisato had to like dash past the Ant Matrix because they were completely um like in like just the middle of nowhere like no one is able to heal them so they get displaced then they actually make valiant guardians displace themselves but there are so many offensive valiant guardians and they're going to be using their artillery strike right off the bat here it's going to force an ant matrix or not an ant matrix oh, sound barrier but the sound barrier was not enough orion still falls what what, what? takes down chisada what was that what even was that Anyway, okay, moving fish just moving around going on a flank to try and dislodge whatever's left of Washington Timeless, but that was just such a great play from Valiant Guardians there to open up with that combo and to follow it up, and they're just taking so much space here. Moving fish just got out the Gravitic Flux, and, like, all they needed was an accretion to cancel it. Just so well played. They will, there will be a recontest, but Bun immediately gets melted, and that's gonna be It's a token second recontest, point. if anything. Yeah, that's actually a gift. If anything, that's Snozzler and Bun going down. This is free. This is free real estate for Valiant Guardians. They're getting everything they've wanted and more. Ultimates, point captures. They're, what else could you want? You've got five minutes, 440 to be exact. In the time bank, this is looking so good for them. Yeah, Snozzler has to make the swap back over to the Bastion. I think there was a swap onto a Tracer to get a touch there. I'm not actually sure. I you know, I was kind of focusing on other things and that being Valiant Guardians marching forward. Chisato going to go ahead and pop the Dragon Blade to take more space. Bun tries to split the rest of Valiant Guardians with the Blizzard and does seem to have at least forced Chisato back. So a great play there from Bun. Despite it not showing up in the kill feed, that is a great use of the Blizzard there to slow things down. That gives Orion time to pop the Ant Matrix. And once again, Valiant Guardians, they can't commit. There is just too much damage threatening to come their way. Now that the window is down, now it's time to go in. But what tools do they have left? They have to build up the Discrovitic Flux here from Moving Fish. They're 1% away. They finally have it. It's going to come out. But Snozzler has taken down Meme already. So this, if anything, is going to be a token fight. As Valiant Guardians, their health bars looking very anemic there. The pickoff onto Bun isn't going to amount to much as Trumu is just in the back line, melting everyone down. And Valiant Guardians have once again stalled out. I'm gonna say it again. I mean, the, the Blizzard, I said before, like, you get one elimination, it's worth it. But if you get a zoning ultimate, like, no joke, that's worthwhile. There, they're able to zone out for long enough where they get the Ant Matrix. They build enough time. Overall, Valiant Guardians just have to continue to kind of poke and prod. They don't find anything. And they finally get that ultimate. They think that's gonna win them the fight. They end up losing members before it ever gets off. They do have a sound barrier. The Washington Timeless Snobs are gonna use their artillery strike. Let's see if it finds any value. It does force out a mortality field. So that is actually some great utility off the board now for Valiant Guardians. Especially with Trumu now coming up onto that Gravitic Flux. The early sound barrier from Karo comes out, but as long as Trumu holds the Flux for just a little bit, that overhealth is going to be gone by the time everyone hits the ground. But despite that, there's not enough damage. Wisp just a little bit too chonky, a little bit too healthy there to finally fall, and Valiant Guardians are able to weather the storm. Another Immortality Field comes out from Meeman and is quickly dispatched. The Amp Matrix from Orion still forcing a lot of positioning, and Valiant Guardians are split right now, and again, they can't really commit here. And even if they can, there's another Blizzard and another Sound Barrier waiting for them. Yeah, Ant Matrix gonna be used. Does Sound Barrier get used as a counter? Yes, it does. They also use the Blizzard. They use everything they have and try to force this out. It's gonna force rotations, but they are able to get the DPS again. The accretion from Trumu onto Chisato there and just all of the follow-up. Bun takes down Wisps and it's all just cleanup for here. And a little bit of a stall out there onto Karo. That's, I, I mean, they definitely could have staggered him out a little bit later if they wanted to, but... Heavy investment for Washington Timeless, but for bleeding the time off the time bank, you absolutely take that. They had five minutes, like actually five minutes when they started this push on third point. It is down now to less than two minutes, a minute 52 and counting. 
they don't have any ultimates like you said, but all that's on the other side is going to be that Gravitic Flux, at least for now. So you keep your immortality field, they can work. Oh, Halo? Halo? Halo gets caught off the wall. This is disastrous. I I, I'm not sure what she was doing up there, and I don't know if Valiant Guardians are either, but regardless, she ain't doing it up there anymore, and Valiant Guardians, with the speed of their own, can continue to march back forward. They have to be on the lookout for this Gravitic Flux from Trumu, and actually, Trumu gonna go and take down Chisato, and Moving Fish has the Gravitic Flux, should be able to pop in here, and might even have to just to stabilize, and Valiant Guardians, without Chisato there, have to back up. Moving Fish goes the wrong way, gets split off, and has to pop the Gravitic Flux to get back, but Halo finds Meme and Trumu takes down Wisp, the Necrovitic Flux from Moving Fish doesn't find anything, and now they're just getting hard focused, melted down, five on one there, and that is a horrible fight there for Valiant Guardians. And with only a minute left... Yeah, it's not a lot of time. Halo does die first, as we talked about, but, you know, it's, it's spawner's advantage, and it, like, playing Lucio, you're gonna get back quicker than anyone else, generally. Any trade that you get, a one-for-one one is gonna be in the defender's favor at this point just because of where the spawn is, and there, they take advantage of it. Again, they force out these weird long fights. Thion Guardians, they get split. Moving Fish tries to use the Critic Flex again after they've already lost members, but now it's gonna be the quick Ant Matrix behind the wall. Yeah, they're trying to press the advantage on Washington Timeless, and they do just that. They take down Caro, and with only 30 seconds left, Valiant Guardians cannot afford to lose another body. They have to go on the aggressive here to force Washington Timeless back. The Ant Matrix and the wheels down from Wisp just to try and do so, and they are able to get a little bit of space back and buy some time to get some ultimate with only a sound barrier and an artillery strike online. What are they going to be able to find for it? They can't even use the artillery what strike. Snozzler is behind there? them. They don't even see Snozzler on the flank. The Ant... The, it, <laughs> The sound barrier comes out from Halo, and Bun gonna go ahead and follow it up with the Blizzard. Orion takes down Caro, and there is nobody from Valiant Guardians that's able to really find much purchase of anything. Snozzler with the flank just takes all of the space right out from under Valiant Guardians, pulls the rug out from under them, and there's just nothing left that they can do. The cart will stall out there on point C, not able to fully cap. I'm guessing Snozzler just literally ran, like, up and then jumped down. I don't think... Like, we can understand how important that pick was. That was one of the only ultimates online for Valiant Guardians was that artillery strike. So when Wiss is taken out by their counterpart in Snozzler, like, one of their biggest tools is just gone. It's done and dusted. And Valiant Guardians have no more time on the clock. They had five minutes, and they just consistently got stopped over and over and over again. Washington Nimeless did a great job of constantly using that aggression to split them up. They got, like, run over. Which is ironic, because that's what Valiant Guardians did in the first two points to get such a good time bank. But Washington Timeless, they adapted, they were able to adjust their own playstyle, and they make it work. It's gonna be still quite a bit of map to go. They gotta go all the way till basically the very end if they want to win this one out. But that was an amazing hold at the last hour. Spawn advantage is a hell of a thing to overcome, especially when Washington Timeless have such a, so a solid game plan and such a great ability to cycle ultimates out. And like you said, finding the picks that they need to find at the moment that they need to find them, not letting Wisps build up to that artillery strike, which even still is kind of like, you know, sometimes a throwaway ultimate just used to bait out immortality field, but you don't, if that's your only tool and you don't even have that, then you just don't really have any way in. There is no key to unlock the door that Washington Timeless put ahead of you. But, you know, as we go in, we're seeing a little bit more of that Sigma versus Sigma. Interesting though, Wisps on the soldier. Also, Kiro gonna be on the Brigida. I like this actually because the Lit Flail can do a lot. It can really disjoint someone. It can stop any sort of push. They're gonna have to leave. Yeah, the wall's gonna come up immediately. Yeah. And oh, Kiro gonna get a taste of their own medicine. So how was that about whipshotting the push there? Didn't really come through. Caro just gets no, run not. over there. But you know, a couple good picks though from Chisato. Snozzler is down. Orion is down. That's a lot of ability for Washington Timeless to control space and fun. Well, for cooldown force down, but hello from the high grounds. True Moon, nobody saw them coming, and that accretion takes down Wisp. And I mean, the remnants of Valiant Guardians are currently surrounded, and they've got Moving Fish forced back into this little alleyway and a nice little May wall to keep them comfy there. And this might actually be Washington Timeless able to recover. They've already got a tick. They're going super, super aggressive here, deep into the enemy spawn to take down Moving Fish, and they do just that. Just unbridled aggression. I really like this. The, this aggressive play that we saw at the end of third point continues. And even though they get that first pick, like they continue to push the the message the entire time. They push for eliminations. They don't just hold the point and say, all right, well, now you can come to us for the recontest and then we'll try to win that fight. No, they're going to go one by one, stagger by stagger, and find that first look, point with Tom. Halo's giving a heart. 
It's giving a little oh bit God. of a heart on the cart. It's uh, giving me flashbacks to World hey. Cup with France. But yeah, they hey. are they are taking such aggressive positioning. Halo's the payload princess right now, while the rest of Washington and Timeless are pushed super far up to try and hold space. And Valiant Guardians have finally come back out of hiding to try and challenge them for it. But a Gravitic Flux is going to come out from Trumu. We'll see what if it's able to find. It doesn't look like a whole lot, but it is going to also force out that duplicate from Chisato, but not able to build it with Blizzard before being forced out. And Wisps takes down Snozzler. Bun forced to invest the Blizzard of her own. And Washington Timeless, despite losing Snozzler, are still going turbo aggressive. Valiant Guardians aren't really able to find a way to dig their heels into the dirt. Oh, the creation. Zato's lucky to be alive right now. This cart continues to roll as this fight is breaking out everywhere. On the cart, off the cart, on the side where you can fall off of the map is going every which way, but this Gravitic Flux from Moodyfish might put an end to it. Oh, it's a great sound barrier from Halo, but it doesn't catch Orion, so the Baptiste now off the field, and without that healing, your Sigma is not long for this world, and this might be Valiant Guardians finally taking some agency in their own destiny, stopping the push from Washington Timeless and getting themselves a strong defensible position. Statistically, this is one of the most difficult points to full nice hold. Like, I think professionally, it's like generally it never happens. But if you get a full, like a, a hold here on second point, it would be huge. I mean, the, mo the more time you can kill off the clock, I think is the most important thing here. So Valiant Guardians, the fact they're able to like actually get a stop to this push after what was a great aggressive attacking round from Washington Timeless on the first point is nice. And uh, now we're going to have a pause to get a little bit more time to discuss this. Mm. But it, th this is the time they got to dig in their heels, right? Especially getting that sound barrier out. That is priceless because now you have a huge advantage. You have your own sound barrier that Kiro has tucked away. You can use it aggressively. You can save it for potentially uh, a Gravitic Flux on the other side. You can save it maybe from another sort of more offensive sided ultimate. Valiant Guardians are in a great spot. Maybe not to like hold this point completely, but I think they at least win one more fight. And the more time they can get out the clock, especially because they didn't get the full cap themselves, the better. I mean, you, you talk about getting that sound barrier out, and it was a great sound barrier from Halo. I love where she was positioned to be able to get that out so she wasn't caught in the Gravitic Flux, but was still able to help those that were caught in it. But while that was all happening, Orion just got segmented off from the rest of the team and ended up getting melted down, didn't get the sound barrier. And again, without your Baptiste able to help sustain everybody else, that overhealth is going to melt away fast. And when it's gone, it doesn't come back. And neither does the rest of your team. It's a great fight for Valiant Guardians to finally, you know, finally get their claws back into this game and find themselves a defensible position at the end of point B there, where, you know, sometimes it takes a C9 to be able to, to cap it. Sometimes. Other times. Other times it takes just that pure unbridled aggression, but if you stop the momentum of Washington Timeless, you know, you kind of have to force them to like put on the brakes a little bit, reassess themselves and feel out the room before they put their foot back down on the gas again. And if you don't give them the chance to do that, you can realistically hold or at the very least bleed a lot of time off the clock. And with how far the cart didn't actually get, you need to bleed off as much time as you possibly can. It did, did it even get around that bend? I don't think it got around the like bend or the second bend um, of that third point. So the like golden box of victory, if you're able to get to the third point as Washington Timeless, is not that far away. Like the capture point is very obtainable. So Valiant Guardians, like you said, they just need to continue to kill that clock as much as possible. The pause is luckily coming to an end. It looks like everyone is regrouping. Wiz has to be Wiz. careful. They're falling yeah. super low. I yeah, mean, Wisp, they, time to get your hand and your your hands back on the keyboard and mouse there, buddy. You definitely don't want to take too much damage going in. Able to sustain just a little bit there, but Bun finds a nice icicle to the dome there, but it's traded out. True move getting taken down there by moving fish and Valiant Guardians. I mean, they have to invest the sound barrier to stay alive, but I think picking off True move there, that's all they really needed. Yeah, I mean, it it gets rid of I guess the advantage we just talked about, the sound barrier advantage, because now you don't have a a counter except for the immortality field for that Gravity Flux when it comes in. Oh, but this could be, it, I mean, this could be a huge stagger if they do trade. They're actually going to commit the Blizzard here. This is, this is either the biggest brain thing I've ever seen, or this is going to cost Washington Timeless so, Orion, so much. They Orion get with the Matrix. Orion finds two. What a, I, I don't even know how that I, I actually happened there. I mean, Snozzler went in with a flank there and had Halo there to help them out a little bit. And, you know, it bought a lot of space in the absence of Trumu, and then while everyone's got their back turned trying to deal with that Sojourn, Orion just pops the M Matrix and melts down too. Snozzler bought so much time for the rest of the team to get back. Also helped with a few eliminations there. They just could not take that Sojourn down. Now they swap to the Bastion, so they're gonna even 
do more damage. And you can see that box of victory. It's not golden. It is going to be purple for Washington Timeless. But this is looking closer and closer. Like it's going to be the end sooner than later. There's no sound barriers we just talked about. So this should be free for True just to let it fly. And there it goes. Oh, and the accretion is no good. Moving Fish not able to stop it, but the Ant Matrix coming out from Meme and might be enough. But Trimu does not care. We'll walk right through that window. Gonna do a little bit of window shopping and maybe is gonna find some bang for their buck there, but Meme not gonna let it happen. Actually gonna take them down and Valiant Guardians might just be able to stabilize here and boy, do they need to. Yeah, because again, that pin con, that golden box, that keeps this purple box of victory. It is so close. Like it is inches away right now. It is. There's not any room for error, literally or figuratively, right now for the side of Valiant Guardians. They do have a great bit of clicks to their name, so they do have a slight ultimate advantage. The Washington Time was like, they've got the sound barrier ready to go, so they could just fight through this. They could over shield through it, and they'd be able to win the fight after. The, the, the wall? Forbidden Flux is their only tool, and they have to cycle their ults perfectly, but it goes wide, it and no Sazler takes down Jisato. That is catastrophic for Valiant Guardians, and Washington Timeless, they can smell blood in the water. It's just a march. The drums beating as they all march forward and take the cart into the golden box of victory. That's a 2-0 for Washington Timeless and what was an incredible series from Valiant Guardians, but it just wasn't enough to pump the brakes and stop Washington Timeless from running them right over. Like lambs to the slaughter. It was touch and go at some moments, but when the Washington Timeless got a little edge, they ran with it. I still can't believe that won that fight on second point. I, I would love to see a replay of that if possible because that was absolute insanity that they were able to win that one out. But I mean, we were expecting a close match. Overall, I would say it was pretty close. Uh, it is again a 2 0 scoreline, but I don't think that really reveals just how back and forth this series was overall. And we got to look like at the, how they did in the best. Valiant Guardians 3 1 in that upper bracket final last time, and then a 3 2 in that grand final between the two teams that Washington Timeless did end up taking. And I think, you know, we can point to those changes in support as maybe one of those big factors. Halo moving over to Washington Timeless. Aramori, again, not able to be in the starting lineup this weekend due to some personal stuff. Hopefully, we'll be able to see her next week in the playoff bracket. But just not able to bring that same sort of fight that they did last time around. Still, good fight, but not the same one. I I'm curious to see what the Halo and Aramori backline is capable of. But what the scary thing is, is they just took down one of the top teams in this entire tournament. 2-0 with Orion, one of their substitutes coming in to play flex support, which is a very highly impactful role. And it feels like the team didn't even miss a beat having that substitute in there. They were still able to play full octane, pedal to the metal, non-stop. And sure, a couple times did get stalled out by Valiant Guardians because they're just that good. But Washington Timeless were just better, just cleaner, specifically on this Sigma composition, the composition that won the Florida Mayhem, the grand champions, the grand championship at grand finals and if this is the meta if this is where things are going and washington timeless are this far ahead of the curve and valiant guardians couldn't stop them who can and i think one thing they did really well and i want to give a big shout out to bun may not the flashiest of dps characters i mean if you hit those headshots across the map obviously that looks great but the wall placement they were just so much good displays but the blizzards are pretty good too a lot of the time not used for those big team fight wins but trying to get someone zoned out in particular and then winning the fight off of that or just creating space like that is what you need from your may they need to be one of the biggest brain players in the room and bunch she played it to perfection she created so much separation we're gonna look at the stats for the tanks and see some of the sigma differences um but overall i gotta give like a shout out um especially to bon and how she played i mean yeah, Bun playing was Bun, Bun's play there was definitely one of the things that helped put Washington Timeless over the edge, and you can even kind of see that picture being illustrated when you look at just the Sigma versus Sigma stats. You see the spike in damage and damage block for moving fish, but the team coordination just favored Trumu so much more that they were able to just roll right over. They didn't have to do as much damage, didn't have to block as much damage, just had to be as effective as they were, hit the big fluxes when they needed to, get the eliminations when they needed to, and trust that your team will be there to follow up on the damage. And more often than not, they definitely were, they, I mean, they definitely were. It, I don't, what else can you really say about it besides Washington Timeless look to be one of the favorites to go all the way. And with performances like that, you've got to be scared no matter who you are, especially if you're a Valiant Guardians, because you have now traveled into the belly of the beast and did not like what you saw. 
Again, this is Swiss stage, so it's not like we're eliminating them to lower bracket or anything. They still got plenty of games. It will be a blemish on that record, so it's not going to be that 5-0 report card they were hoping for on the side of Valiant Guardians. It's going to be a 4-1 at best, but still very reasonably decent record if they're able to obtain that. I'm expecting them, honestly, to be able to get a 4-1. I, I think they're like definitely top three in this tournament, even with some differences in their support lineup for this iteration of Calling All Heroes. But I'm expecting great things for them regardless. But we're going to be talking to a member of Washington Timeless just momentarily. So don't go anywhere, folks. We got a break before that interview, but it's going to be a good one. After a banger of a match that we had in Swiss round two, a, p a potential foreshadowing for what the playoffs might look like. Washington Timeless take it 2-0 over Valiant Guardians. And we have Sawhill from Washington Timeless here to help celebrate with us. Sawhill, how are you doing? And how does it feel to be back for another Calling All Heroes tournament? Hey everyone, uh, I'm doing great. Uh, it feels nice to see my team win. It feels nice to... Um... You know, have been practicing and it looks like it's paying off and I'm just like happy to have started another tournament. We've been practicing a lot and we think we'll do well this time. Well, it's definitely looking like that practice is paying off. A 2-0 win, a sweep over, you know, a team I'd consider Washington Timeless's nemesis, Valiant Guardian. How does it feel to take that win in such a dominant fashion, scoreline wise? Well, honestly, like it was pretty much expected. I'm not going to lie, I think we were pretty prepared to just come in and win dominantly. I mean, last time, kind of a fluke, not going to lie. We're a lot better now, we've had a lot of practice, and I think uh, we're going to keep showing that kind of presence for the rest of the tournament. I got to say, I love the heat that Calling All Heroes is bringing. There are no words minced whatsoever. I mean, everyone is just saying exactly how they feel, and that's great for the spirit of competition. Uh, I gotta ask, now that, you know, your team has knocked off, or at least for now, one of the more, I would say, like, highly rated teams in the competition, is there any other team that you guys have your sights set on? Any other team that you're looking forward to playing and hoping to beat as well? 
Um, I I'd say the only team other than Guardians that we we're kind of looking at is Drainers, because uh, we played them in a couple tournaments before and we've had like mixed results against them. But I think this time around we'll do really well against them, and I'm... take the series. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing if you guys go head to head with Drainers. Hopefully we get the we get a good playoffs match between the two of you going down the line there. But you know, speaking of the practice that you guys have been putting in, I'm liking what I'm seeing with these Sigma compositions that we're seeing. Very uh, reminiscent of the Grand Finals winning composition that Florida Mayhem came out with. Is that you know the team's strategy is to just you know go with what is the meta and be ahead of the curve? And how do you feel about uh, how the way your team is playing this composition? Well, I'm gonna be honest. Our comp we're kind of just sandbagging right now. <laughs> like, these aren't our real comps, this is just Swiss, and we're just, like, mirroring everyone because we know we're better. But we have some real stuff cooking up, cooking up for the playoffs, that's when I come in. I don't know if I, I, don't know if I believe you, like, if because you look so practiced on this composition, the coordination just feels there, like, Bun puts up a wall and somebody just dies. Like, you've practiced this, surely. Oh, uh, we, we've dabbled here and there in it, yeah, a little bit. Uh, Okay, well, maybe a little bit, but maybe you are just that good. And if you are just that good, it's going to be scary for any other team that goes against you going forward. But that is going to be it for our interview. Sawhill, uh, thank you for having, or thank you for being here. Uh, do you have any shout outs you want to give before we send you off? Uh, yeah, shout out to our coach, SNR, cooking up some crazy stuff in scrims. Shout out to our two managers, Debit and Lily. One of them might be a better manager than the other. They know which one they are. And. Yeah, that's about it. Thank you for having me. I love a little bit of managerial shade. Thank you so much for coming in, giving us a little bit of insight, and we look forward to seeing Saw Hill as we go forward. But we still have one more game for you guys, chat. As much of a banger as that one was, I do wish we could have gone to Flashpoint on that one, but this wasn't in the cards today. But there might be a, there might be a three mapper in the cards for our third Swiss round. You never know. Yeah, I'm praying for it. I think. I mean, I I might be. Not in the majority of this. I actually really like Flashpoint as a game mode. I think it's like controlled to a whole new level. It adds some really interesting versatility, especially with the maps that we have so far um, in it. But we're going to take a look at the standings first before we get to that third round match. We're not sure exactly who's going to be on stream just yet, but we do know who's going 2-0 thus far, 1-1, one, one, and then unfortunately 0-2. Uh, Vancouver Titans Blue, you and I had actually talked about this off stream. We were yeah. kind of hoping this is a team that would show up a little bit more. They've been around since the beginning of Calling All Heroes. One of the first, I would see, Overwatch League partner teams in the scene. Definitely the longest lasting one after the unfortunate demise of New York Excelsior Academy. So to see them start off this strong, I really like to see because I feel like generally they haven't necessarily shown like the best overall standing results. I mean, we want to talk about Vancouver Titans Blue really quick. I do want to, you know, I met some of their players at, uh, at Grand Finals. And I can confirm that a couple of them did walk away with that grand final sickness. So, I mean, they're having their Michael Jordan flu games over there and they're they're flying pretty high, able to keep that flawless map win record, get themselves the top spot for now. That's really impressive. And I'm hoping to see them uh, stick around at the top. I want to see them make a deep playoffs run, but they got to get there first. It's only round two of Swiss. We have the third one coming up here. Just after this, once we get the rest of these games sorted out and we get it all, figured out and we're going to throw to a quick little break while we figure this out. Be on the lookout for round three coming up after this.
Welcome back, everybody, to Calling All Heroes Rise Together Minor 3, hosted by Toronto Defiance. And if you're just joining us, we have just completed round two of our Swiss stage, going into round three here. But in round two, we had Washington Timeless and Valiant Guardians going blow for blow and showing us just what this level of competition means to these marginalized gender players, these underrepresented players and talent, what it all means, and just how much we all love and support Calling All Heroes. The action speaks for itself but chat what if you don't just want to watch and support calling all heroes what if you want to get involved jag how how could chat do that well there are plenty of ways to get involved with calling all heroes first of all you can head to the website callingallheroes.gg to learn more about exactly what this is a gender inclusivity program and exactly how it works you can also go to the start.gg slash calling all heroes page to see all current and upcoming competitions like this one that you are watching right now and then last but certainly not least if you want to get involved as a player participate yourself join the official calling all heroes discord for a chance to either form or join a team there's still plenty of time to get yourself in there as a player get yourself maybe some of the cash prizes with major three around the corner who knows maybe get yourself some circuit points make a name for yourself so when calling all heroes comes around again people are going to want you on their team there's plenty of room to grow and cultivate as a player and as a talent any part any role there's so much room for you to grow and learn and it's a wonderful experience and i can safely say that i wouldn't be where i am without calling all heroes and i'm so thankful that this program exists and that we have a place for us all to learn and grow and that you guys can get involved because that is absolutely incredible but speaking of incredible we just witnessed an incredible matchup and we've got one more for you coming at you it's going to be fable versus aegis to close out the night here we got these two teams and there's a lot of moving parts on both of these teams some very well-known players on some newer rosters we'll see how they end up shaking shaking things out here yeah, and this is a big statement game. I do believe they are both 2-0 in the standings currently. So 
two of the top teams currently through the first two rounds of competition and only one of them again can go undefeated something's got to give one of these teams going to fall out of that perfect score line that perfect series line and i i gotta just talk about fable really quickly i feel like just from experience like from what we've seen from them already they are probably the team to beat i mean they did really well in the last minor finished with the eighth making it all the way to that playoff bracket is an accomplishment in itself um and avery the their tank player uh has been in the scene for a long time i believe i have casted them through like uh, initiatives like this other areas of path of pro as well as collegiate so they have been a namestay in competitive overwatch and they have always been a standout performer Hey, and you know what? They also helped me edit my reel. So shout out to Avery for that one. Not just a great player, but also, you know, a great editor. A true homie. Yeah, a true homie. What, what can I say? Thank you so much for that. But hey, that's not what we're here for today. Today, we're here to see how well you perform with your team on the stage here. And of course, you know, Avery is no slouch. Avery is definitely very capable of holding their own. And along with this backline, I'm interested to see what the Fable backline has to offer. We got Gusty and we got Panther coming in and i know panther from several other teams is a very capable support player can pop off especially on that kitty go so i want to see what fable comes out here with it's an interesting team potential lots of potential for some interesting looks here it anyone's guess what they're going to come out here with and anyone's guess what aegis is going to come out with as well yeah we're gonna have to see that lineup pulled up momentarily and see what they can bring to the table. I'm already loving the Doomfist. Just give me more Doomfist, please. Like, th there's not even a really specific reason. I'm not even saying like that Doomfist is the best tank to play. I just think it's the most fun tank to watch and commentate on. But going, like, we know this is gonna be an Antarctic Peninsula first map. And you know, obviously they're just favorite heroes. These aren't necessarily heroes they're gonna mm. play. But I feel like Antarctic Peninsula is a very brawl centric map. Like I'm expecting like Orisa, Ryan, Junker Queen. So we're gonna have to see if Aegis can kind of play to that style or if they're going to try to do their own thing. I'm glad you mentioned Junker Queen specifically, because remember at the top of the show when I touted Kindred as potentially the best Junker Queen in all of Calling All Heroes, I say potentially because there is another, and if she decides to come out with it, Mari is a very, very capable Junker Queen player that can take control of the entire game into her own hands. And with a team like this to support her, that is definitely something to be on the lookout for. And like you said, Antarctic Peninsula, it does indeed play into that Junker Queen style, that rush style, something that she's going to be really, really good at. I don't expect we're going to see the Doomfist. I would probably expect to see the Junker Queen come out. And if so, I would watch out if I'm Fable. Yeah, this can be... I feel like this is a very interesting control map versus the others. I feel like there's a lot of high ground generally in the other maps. I don't really feel like that except for one sub map on Antarctica Peninsula, but generally it is like almost always an all out brawl just on the center of the map, right on that objective, right on that point. So Doomfist can work potentially, but I feel like Doomfist works way better into something like a Reinhardt because Reinhardt doesn't have a lot of stain ability. He just kind of gets knocked down. He's an old German man. You know, th there isn't much he can do. Junker Queen young australian woman she's just running around carving people up throwing knives at them so it's a very different matchup depending old, on what we see mari come out with old german men known for being quite top heavy you push them down they'll just topple right over but australian women yeah they uh they stand tall they've got the knives like you said they're very difficult to dislodge especially if you're playing a dive hero junker queen is a great anti-dive hero so if we do see that doomfist come out yeah i expect the junker queen to counter it uh but like you know, I think like you mentioned, there's only one map on Antarctic Peninsula that isn't, is even a little bit conducive to a dive play style. I believe that's sub-levels. Uh, and, and even then, I would probably expect Winston to come out more than the Doomfist, because you want to dive and pounce on the targets, less about like the disruption and dislodging them. But uh, I just don't think that's where the meta is. Like, we haven't really seen a whole lot of teams coming out here with the dive. Even on maps like Numbani, they're opting to play more of the Sigma poke or that Sigma rush hybrid composition that we've seen a lot. So I, I think... I'm thinking Queen. I'm thinking Queen here. I'm always thinking about Junker Queen, but right now I'm thinking Junker Queen. I mean, who isn't, honestly? It's just a fun <laughs> character to play, and that is the only thing I'm thinking about, of course. But, uh, I mean, I think you bring up a great point about, like, Winston and Dive. It just doesn't really make sense. We've seen it very sparsely. I think really the only team we've seen it play, at least on stream, is Yippie Carry, and it was for, you know, a brief moment of time. It, it was, didn't yeah, work out Winston for Terra. Winston got blown up for, like, five seconds, and then we never saw it again. And I do want to point out, they actually did win their second match. So, you know, you and I were saying that we think they could make playoffs. The one and one, still in great standing to make that happen. But um, yeah, I think like Labs, Icebreaker are very much just like two teams just running at each other head on. So I, again, like Jugger Queen, I am expecting, we could see some variation of it, but 
Like, I, I think Ryan honestly is not that strong unless you can really utilize like the Symmetra play that we've seen in Overwatch League playoffs. That really is what enables him to get around. Because again, old German man, very slow. Even with his charge beyond that, he can't really do much. Bigger Queen, she just shouts. Everyone's like, okay, like we'll follow you. Like, don't, please, we're scared of you. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I think she just has so much mobility that I think it's just a better thing uh, or a better character to run here. I, I, I tend to agree. If you have that level of coordination, though, with the sim play, a Reinhardt composition can be quite lethal. But that comes down, I think, more to team cohesion rather than just, you know, playing to the hero's strengths. Just, you know, everyone coming together as a collective to be one big death ball that just rolls over the enemy team. And if that's what either of these teams come out with, then, you know, that's a... It's gonna be a little bit of a difficult thing to dislodge because you can't really account for just playing against someone who's that well coordinated, that much of a hive mind. And with that in mind, we've predicted a lot about the compositions. What do you feel about the scoreline of this match? We've had two back-to-back 2-0s despite them being close. Is this another 2-0 or are we gonna finally get the elusive flashpoint? Give me map three. I wanna see <laughs> map three. Give it to me. Let, let me cast Suravasa or New Junk City, please. That That is all I'm asking for. Also, I just want like a cool, like a, I want a really great series to end the day off on. These two teams are 2-0, and so there's a lot at stake here. Like we talk about like, one of these teams gonna go down to two and one. That is a blemish on your report card you do not want. Only a handful of teams, I think actually maybe only one team at the end of the day can actually finish with that undefeated scoreline. So getting you that one like step closer to it is so important. We're not gonna see Joker Queen at all. We talked about this for like 10 minutes for nothing. It's gonna be Sigma. It's always gonna be Sigma, but there is variation in the DPS, which I think is really important. We see the May Bastion, which is like, I guess the more meta, like we saw Florida Mayhem run. On the other side though, it's going to be a Genji as well as a Soldier. Yeah, I'm curious to see how this ends up playing out for Fable because you see how much space Aegis has already taken and they've got control of the high ground and that's just with the benefit of the Lucio, the damage that's coming out from death. Quite an apropos name, especially if you're Arya right now who's feeling, yeah, feeling how apropos it is, feeling a little bit of death for themselves. And yeah, now Aegis is going to go ahead and drop down right on top of Avery and they don't have a whole lot of support to stand on, especially once that immortality field gets melt down death, dishing out all the more of it. Wheels go down. Aegis are going to take the first point. Branding death from above, indeed, living up to their namesake, causing it everywhere. And this makes sense because we were, we're gonna get some just mileage talking out of that. about. We're gonna get some mileage <laughs> out of death. But we were just talking about like sub level. Like this probably wouldn't make sense to run the brawl, so it does make sense for more of a poke comp. But they are both running Lucio, so there still is some speed, some quickness, some rotation that's involved with it. But Aegis is playing so aggressively. They're playing this one. They get the wall too. They force out the lamp. Yeah, and again, once that lamp is done, Avery's life is on the clock, and Mari gonna go ahead and take it away, and Fable, they can't even really get out of their own spawn without Aegis giving them a hard time for it. That's 30%, and there hasn't even really been much of a fight, just Avery getting melted down twice, Arya once again getting caught out, and it's so hard not to get caught out when you can't even poke your head out of your own front door and feel safe about it. This might be a spawn camp and calling all heroes. They, oh, they're gonna back <laughs> off. Okay, so they're gonna play natural cover, which is the smart thing to do. But no, I want them into the... their trap there. Yeah, right, right to the ant matrix. Yeah, and the dragon blade gonna come out from Zoe. We'll see if it's able to find much of anything. It does find Keith. That's a great way to take the wind out of Aegis's sails. And now Fable can finally march forward, get themselves some presence on the point. At 58%, they're able to clean up Aegis, and Fable have finally gotten themselves on the board. And that's so unfortunate, Jay. They were so close to that sound barrier that could have turned the fight, but didn't get it online until just now. And I'm gonna say it, if they went for the spawn camp, and if they played in their spawn, they wouldn't have lost that point so quickly. That fight would have gone on longer. They would have had to go a longer distance. Just more reason for the spawn camp to come out eventually. But Aegis, now they're gonna have to try to flip this point once again. They did get out some, or at least only, it was actually only the blade. That feels like not that much for all the value Fable got. Now they're gonna use um, a Gabritic Flux. Yeah, that's gonna force out not only the ice block, but also the sound barrier. And now that that overhealth is all gone, Fable can clap back with one of their own. Gusty hits everybody with theirs, but they're, the Blizzard coming out from Fifi and Aegis, they're able to just leverage his ult advantage to get themselves some positioning. And Fable, they're scattered. They're all over the place. Arya popping the overclock, but is there, is there even going to be a potential target? There's only one. It's Jade that falls, but Aegis, they are able to withstand. And once they dislodge Zoe here, it should be the flip coming through. But taking down death might actually mean there could be a recontest coming out kind of early in this next fight. Yeah, that could be huge. Uh, I mean, Jay's gonna have to make a decision. Do they go back and try to get death? Or do they just try to fight this out in the numbers that they have and hope that they can sell out? The good news for Aegis is that they got a lot of ultimates out from Fable despite using a lot of them themselves. The bad news is that Zoe has that Dragon Blade almost online. And that was the big fight turner last time around. They've got to find some sort of counter now that 
their sound barrier is gone. The mortality field's not gonna like sustain them throughout all of it. They do have an ammo, so they gotta use it initially now. They actually have to use the immortality field early. That's an interestingly placed ant matrix there. It seems to be mostly for heals right now and to try and put out a little bit of damage from death, but Babel can just LOS that. They're totally fine. They do lose Arya though, as Jay goes in a little bit aggressive there and Zoe gonna fall as well. They're not able to pop that dragon blade and that is catastrophic. Aegis just gonna go ahead and march forward knowing all threats have been cleared. They just have to get rid of the bodies and they're going to be able to take sub levels here. If Fable has anything left to say about it, Avery with a Gravitic Flux finds Keith. That could be absolutely massive and takes out jay as well fable they're able to flip this courtesy of that gravitic flux death is still there though still melting to everyone else down Arya gonna deal with that zoe is back and fable find the flip and they still have the blade that was almost disastrous i thought for sure zoe got, went for the like smart play tried to take sea panther offline but ended up costing their life but now it all works out. They have the blade for this fight. Jay does, however, have the sound barrier almost online. They could actually try to use even like a blizzard to try to just lock him down, freeze them up as a counter. So he's gotta be careful they don't get melted down. Uh, yeah, but it's a little dicey. A little dicey, but they get out. This is gonna come down to who can just execute their ultimates better in Aegis. They have more at least for the time being. Zoe gonna go ahead and pop the dragon blade. That's gonna force out the sound barrier from Jay and Zoe. They know they don't even really have to go all that aggressive to try and get a lot of value. Just getting that ult is all they really need because now Mari gonna go ahead and come in with the Gravitic Flux, death with the artillery nope. strike, and this is all Aegis in the kill feed. Fable, they had a great run there for a second, but it's time to pack it up and go home. Sub level belongs to Aegis. I was watching Gusty's ultimate, and you wanna know what happened? Oh, was it a was it an Ajax? It was an Ajax. They were in the middle oh. of their sound barrier, lifted up into the Gritic Flux, and they never got it off. That is so painful. That could have completely changed the course of this fight. I mean, the fact that Fable battled back at all, like again, we've seen some crazy close control maps every series. It seems like it's going the full distance, going all three sub maps. Everyone is like going to 99.99 for the most part, with some 100 zero sprinkled in. But that is so unfortunate. Gusty could have completely changed how that fight went. Instead, Aegis able to rely on that early lead they built up, take that first sum up. And if Aegis is able to get a 2-0 here, you're going to be looking back at that moment. And Fable, they could have capitalized, but that ultimate not going off is just so punishing. It's such a high-value ultimate that it is just such a shame to lose it that, you know, it, it's potentially just a fight ender if you're not able to get the sound barrier off successfully. I mean, got to be looking at Gusty to try and clean that one up and not get caught out like that again. But that was a great Uber Flux from Mari to cause that. And Aegis, they're going to keep the momentum high. They're going to keep going, taking this high ground. And, you know, it does feel like two brawl teams just slamming into each other over and over again. But if you have control of this high ground, it makes it all the easier to be the one doing the slamming versus being the one that just has to kind of sit there and figure out what to do with all of it is Aegis. They've already taken down Z Panther. That's death taken down Avery as well. That Bastion is just so lethal. It's so hard to be a tank player when there's a Bastion on the field. It's so hard to be in anything when you don't have a tank on the field. And that's the value that Bastion brings to the table. Yeah, I'm starting to think that, I mean, you, you do get the trade, but and you actually do get the first point cap. But other than that, you're not going to get much of anything in that fight. I'm starting to think Fable might want to try to swap up their DPS lineup, at least maybe the Sojourn. I'd love to see maybe a Bastion or a Meg, just something else. The Sojourn on its own, I mean, Arya is playing it well, like no qualms there. I just don't know if it's enough damage to really go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Bastion from Death on the other side. That Death is just putting in so much damage consistently. And Arya is kind of relying more on building up that Railgun and trying to go for that full charge shot to actually get that same sort of effect. Not being able to find that same success, at least through this first fight. And now Aegis, not only do they have the capture, now they also have Ant Matrix, which they are probably looking to use right now. It, it, it's the pick potential of the Soja that you're going for, but that only really matters if someone pokes their head out, and Keith does just that. To illustrate my point, that's a great pick off there from Arya, and with all the healing gone, Fable, they found themselves a way in. Avery gonna take down Death, facing down Death itself and taking them down, and Aegis, they're evicted from the point there. Great play from Arya to open it up, and Fable have gotten themselves on the board here. Pretty sure Arya heard me say those things and immediately was like, no, 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 no. This is why the Sojourn works. And when you have that railgun charged up and you hit shots like that, especially onto an important target like Keith, you just win the fight outright. The sound barrier being committed also is a huge win. They try to use it to sustain throughout the fight, but they don't have the healing on top of it. And now that's going to be a free blade. I mean, Fable should have a free fight win here unless things go horribly wrong. 
you gotta look at Gusty and the sound barrier coming out there. Zoe gonna go ahead and pop the Dragon Blade. Immortality Field to try and keep death alive, but the Immortality Field is all death is able to find with the artillery strike of their own, and Zoe takes down Keith, and with just that Dragon Blade and the sound barrier to boot, Fable are putting in the pressure, but they keep investing, actually. They're gonna pop the oh. overclock, and they're getting some value for it, but I gotta wonder if that's an overcommitment. That was everything they had. I didn't even see the sound barrier, but it came out. I think that was in retaliation to the artillery strike, which isn't necessarily the worst idea in the world. But using the overclock after you won that fight, it's important to get Sagar because it's important to force Aegis into an uncomfortable position where they this is their last fight. But now there's nothing left. Like that sound barrier could have been huge into what's going to be an upcoming blizzard from Fifi. They that have nothing except the immortality field. Death makes the swap. You no longer have to worry about the Bastion. You also don't have to worry about Zoe, though, because Death just goes right in with a rail shot, takes down the Cyborg Ninja there, and it's gonna be Avery getting melted down. But the amp the Immortality Field is good, being able to weather the storm through the Maywall, but it's just not enough. It doesn't last forever. There's too much pressure, and Aegis put on the pressure and flipped the point back in their favor, but 92% for Fable, and they do have a way in. We're playing a game of anything you can do, I can do better. Death makes a swap, immediately gets the first pick. They save the uh, the Blizzard. They also now have an Amatrix of their own. And like I said, Aegis is completely back in this. They are completely changed their fate. They are in the swing of things. The ult advantage, they're gonna have Sound Barrier too. There's no Blade in sight. And there's only two fights left. I mean, if this goes long for Fable, if they get staggered out too much, this might be last fight right here. I'm looking at Avery with this Gravitic Flux. They pulled out a Miracle out of a hat before, but can they do it once more? Ant Matrix for Ant Matrix, both teams not wanting to show too much face, take too much damage early on. Just gonna kite those ultimates out until they expire. And now it's Gravitic Flux for Gravitic Flux. Sound Barrier for Sound Barrier. Fifi though is holding onto the Blizzard and they're gonna go ahead and let it rip. The Sound Barrier from Gusty to try and keep everyone alive, but that should mean a free Gravitic Flux and Avery isn't able to use theirs. Mari gonna pop their Gravitic Flux. Sound Barrier comes out from Jay and there is nothing that Fable can do to withstand all of the health bars, all of the damage, all of the ultimates that Aegis came out here with. And despite a close performance here on Labs, Aegis will take Antarctic Peninsula 2-0. to zero. That's our first 2-0 of the day here on Control. Uh, I'm not feeling so great about what my personal hope was that we go to a third map with performance like that. Again, it was close. It was neck and neck. But it just, it just seemed like they had that clutch factor every time they needed something to go their way. It did. The swaps, the positioning, the alt bank just being a bit better. It all worked out for them. And I, I'm just going to go back to kind of that first fight. Death on that Bastion, I feel like, has been a big difference maker. But even when they swapped the Sojourn, immediate impact. That first pick was like a statement elimination saying, hey, I've swapped. I'm mirroring you now. And I'm still going to be the one who's doing better. And what a statement it was being able to just run the rest of that uh, sub map all the way to 100 and take it to zero. In order to really get value out of the Sojourn, like I said, you do have to either catch someone out of position and get that rail shot onto them, or you have to try and take off angles. And if you're doing that, you're not putting out the same amount of pressure onto the enemy tank as the Bastion is. The enemy tank can't play as safely as they want to. They have to try and be safe. And with that being the case, the rest of your team just doesn't really have space, so you have to come up huge with some of those rail shots, and both Sojourns were able to do just that, but it ended up being Death that got the better of that exchange in that fight, which is, I honestly, <clears throat> excuse me, honestly, I think what actually dictated the whole thing, because if you look at the Sigmas going back and forth, both Sigma players, Avery and Mari, are playing near flawlessly with each other, but it's just, who is forcing errors from the rest of the teams around them, and it's Fable that are making a little bit more of those mistakes, forced or unforced, and Aegis that are capitalizing on them. Death comes from us all one way or another <clears throat> right now. It is going for Fable's backline, but I also want to go back to a play we had talked about a bunch when it happened, the very unfortunate Ajax that happened back on map one. And I was saying, you know, if you lose map two, you're going to be kicking yourself for this because that was your opportunity to win. If they hit that sound barrier, and it's not like, I'm not going to like, call anyone like obviously it's been very unfortunate if you're the lucio player gusty but there's so many factors go into it you're in the gravitic flux you're being focused fire again everyone hears you cast the ultimate and that sound uh, that that voice line goes out before you actually land on the ground or actually use the ultimate and it has one of the longest cast times in the game too but that could have been a complete change we could have seen you know submap three that could have been it going fable's way but it did not and just as you were saying like near flawless from bo uh, both of these sigmas putting out pretty similar numbers Except when you look at eliminations, I think that's the big thing we noticed this in the last series too. It's not about damage necessarily, 
or even damage blocked, it's about helping your team get those eliminations. My eyes personally gravitate down more to the damage blocked deaths. and the deaths on the side of Avery, because yeah. if you look at, like, like the damage just is pretty similar throughout and i feel like if you're on the winning team that eliminations is going to be just a little bit higher but that shows how much pressure avery was under especially from the bastion they can't exist comfortably they have to block so much damage and eventually they're going to crumble because mari is just not under the same pressure she can just go ahead and dish out all of the all of the hurt that she wants continue to take all of the space continue to push avery and the rest of the gang back and there's not a whole lot that they can do about it I am a big believer that Bastion is kind of the major driving force in the meta. I am begging and pleading for a Bastion nerf to make the rest of the tank cast playable. Let I mean, I'm glad they killed Dive meta because Winston was lingering around for just a little bit too long in the meta. But like, did they have to like not only kill it, but just like nuke, nuke it entirely at a subatomic level by having Bastion become this now driving force between every team composition? Like, come on. Well, unfortunately, that is going to be the current meta, the current patch notes still in favor of Bastion for the time being. Uh, I think it's interesting, though, because you can also notice, like, the deaths was way lower on the side of Mari, and I think a big part of that is because of that Bastion. Like you said, like, it's not fun to play tank into Bastion, but you don't have that answer on the other side. It doesn't work, and Sojourn is great at picking off squishier characters, supports, uh, other DPS because of that railgun, like, fully charged in the headshot capability. But it feels like when you shoot into a uh, tank as Sojourn, you're kind of just like firing like a nerf gun at them. It's just like kind of bouncing off them. If they can get healed up, it doesn't really matter. The railgun shots, I, I think with an overclock, if you like consistently just hit like headshot after headshot after headshot, then you can find value of the Sojourn into a tank. But in general, not so much. We are going to be moving on to map two. And for the third time today, it's going to be Numbani. I'm... I'm really wondering what it is about Numbani that these like teams like so much, but hey, we've seen it every time. I, th I so what I think it is, and this is just my kind of tinfoil hat theory about it. I don't know. It might be <clears throat> it might be a complete misread of the meta right now, but because a lot of these teams are playing like that Sigma poke composition, they want to play the hybrid map that lets them have the most control over high ground on the defensive there, where they know that they can just melt down a dive composition. I think a lot of these teams are playing for that defensive hold. And if they're not able to get it, then they're just playing what they've been practicing, what's been their biggest strength, what are they able to get out of it? That said, you know, having it be the one that has this high ground and where it does kind of seem to favor dive on the attack, that's always something that we could see. And we do know that again, yeah, Mari likes to pop out with that Doomfist every now and then, she's great at it, but she's also really, really good at the Sigma and that might be what they decide to go for on the defense. It's really anybody's ball game here, but I think just because Sigma is like, the the meta when it comes to hybrid right now this is where everybody is currently practicing and also ba like just bastion it's a great map for bastion and chat i want you all to do something like when the show when the show's over here if you don't believe me load it oh we got time okay cool i can go off on this tangent we're going for a pause oh, real boy. quick if you don't <laughs> believe me go into even just a quick play game after the show today boot it up pick pick tank in roll queue pick winston and See what happens after you have one good fight. What's going to happen is one of the enemy DPS is going to play Bastion. And suddenly the tank rock, paper, scissors doesn't mean diddly squat anymore because you now need your DPS to either match or shut down the Bastion or you just simply don't get to play the game. You get to find a corner to peek, get real acquainted with the paint on that wall, peek out, maybe take a little space and then get forced back with your tail tucked between your legs. You get the primal leap back to spawn basically is what you're saying you know you go in and you're out immediately yeah. back into the gray screen it's but, like the yeah i not... you put your you put your left foot in bastion takes it off so you take your left foot out <laughs> you swap oh, oh, the jungle is... queen and you use commanding shout that's what it's oh, all that... about let's go that was a really good rhyme you know kudos to you that was very well thought out we gotta all we gotta make fly. a parody of that someone gotta make a parody of that one day but for I can now, audibly hear the scenes. cringe coming out from all of chat for that one. Good. The, the <laughs> cringier, the better. But what we're going to see is that Fable is actually going to be running the Bastion themselves, something that we did not see at all on Antarctic Peninsula. And Aegis does, does not have it at all. They are actually going back to the Sojourn, going to a Genji, so they are running the same line for DPS lineup that Fable ran and lost on. Yeah, a little bit of a Missy Elliott flip it and reverse it, but Fable just walking right over them. Mari dead, Jay dead, Death able to clean up Gusty, but I don't think that's going to be all that much when you have already lost so many resources. And Aegis, yeah, they, uh, they're about done. This Fable just go ahead and walk forward and take point A. And 
this is again where we were talking about where if you can't hold the high ground effectively with this composition, it just kind of crumbles. And now the momentum is in Fable's favor. Absolutely, they get the swap. They're all, uh, they get the uh, the point. They are now going to force Aegis to swap, so they've gone back to the May Bastion. And I think the most interesting wrinkle of this is the Iliari. So a lot of damage, a lot of potential healing, as long as that pylon is up up online and there it's taken off, so not as much healing capability. It doesn't allow them to speed in though, which is something that we've seen a lot of these Sigma comps do, despite it being more of a poke-based style. They have no really way to engage, they have no way to disengage, and they can get run through just like they are right now. Yeah, once you scout out that composition and you realize that the Iliari is not great at or at close range, you go in and you close the distance, but it might have been too little too late because Fable already had the captive sun. Z Panther just puts out so much damage and so much healing that they already have that ability. And sure, Aegis might have tried to run and close the distance, but they just ran into a brick wall. Captive Sun is one of the least extensive ultimates in the game because you do so much with her. You get alt percentage firmer healing pylon as well as the damage that she's outputting. So it's the best of both worlds. It's a very powerful ultimate if you can land it there. It does. It helps get two off the board. Now Aegis, they are scrambling. They are trying to find a way back in. They're going to use an Ant Matrix to try to make it happen. It's a great place to amp Matrix, but the wall kind of works a little bit against them there from Fifi. They can't really, you know, commit too much, and Fable are able to duck and dodge it, but the remaining members of Aegis drop off the high ground, weed out those that were ducking in the trenches from Fable, and Fable, they don't expend any ultimates, but they are still forced to back out, and Aegis have found themselves that defensible position on the at the end of point B. It's gonna come down to J, I think. I mean, they are still 25% away right now from that sound barrier, so there is still a lot of room to go before they actually get up to it. And there's so many ultimates from Fable, everything except from that Captain Sun, but they lose Arya. Yeah, and there's that all that aggression coming out from Aegis. They invest the Gravitic Flux and they splat Avery back down to Earth and Fable, they're not able to do a whole lot when they don't have the space. This is again, that Ilyari versus the Lucio that we're seeing where Aegis have the ability to go aggressive and take space where Fable, they have to rely on Panther hitting those shots. Yeah, and it's easier said than done. I mean, there's a lot of amazingly talented flex supports in Calling All Heroes, but... Panther is one of them. The, even with that being the case, it's just there's... Who do you even take out on the side of Aegis? I mean, it's really Baptiste or Bust, because Jay can run around, the Sigma is tanky, May is tanky, Bastion is literally a tank. So the... I mean, you can create some space now, and this is huge, because now you can do a lot of, like, damage, and they're really worried about you firing through the Ant Matrix, but other than that, like, if they run into you, you're gonna be much less useful. That's a little bit of BM for Arya to go for death there with that uh, that artillery strike as both Bastions popped it. But Fifi gonna go ahead and pop the Blizzard and the Captive Sun comes out from Z Panther, but it's not enough to get much of anything as Aegis, they're looking pretty strong here. I take it back actually, the Captive Sun takes down Keith and Fable. They're still in this and they're still pushing the cart. Aegis, they might have just fumbled it. They get the Blizzard and Z Panther's actually caught in it. But despite that, they still get the elimination. Now they've swapped onto the Lucio. And that's a four mana time bank. That is so much time to work with on Nimbani. And it is, you can see them, like they're they're struggling. They're trying to find something that works. They've swapped death to the ash now after the bashing just wasn't enough. And Fable still has such a healthy ult bank. They are so close to that duplicate, not too far away from the Gravitic Flux. They are making some great, great time. We've seen so many teams get stalled out here on this final point, especially around this bend. Can they be the difference maker or will it be the same story we've seen thus far? Death made a swap over onto the Ash, but I don't know if there's really a good angle to play here. I think you're essentially just playing for the Dynamites there, but speaking of Dynamites, there's gonna be a Dynamite play coming out from Aegis. They're gonna go ahead and pop that sound barrier, trying to go aggressive and trying to take some, some space, but Avery does not want to let them do it. Another Gravitic Flux and Z Panther gonna just snipe Jay out of the sky like skeet shooting. And with the duplicate from Zoe, Fable can just keep the pressure on. Mari pops the Gravitic Flux and takes down Avery, so Aegis are still lingering around, but I think they've taken too many casualties. Fable are just going to keep marching forward. Well, they do lose Arya though, so they, they should get at least a little bit more progress. They won't get stuck on this first bend, but I think that's about all you can get now. It's time to completely uh -huh. back off. Uh, will they get found out? It looks like they will just barely get out. It's a nice shield placement by Avery to help make sure that the rest of the team is able to survive through that. And they still have Captive Sun. They still have uh, the Ant Matrix. And yeah, you, you're right. Death use Bob. I didn't even see it on the field and they got really no value from it. I mean, it, it buys them just a little bit of time to get this corner position back, which is what you want. This is where you want to hold if you're Aegis. But 
As far as ults, the coffers are running quite dry for Aegis and Fable. They have everything they could ever want. They could just go ahead and throw away this artillery strike realistically, use it to force out some ultimates and force some positioning, and they're gonna get all the positioning. The captive sun goes in, Zoe goes in with the cleanup, Keith is down, Jay is gonna follow, and Fable, they press the advantage, they invest where they need to, and they are marching in towards the checkpoint. Is there even gonna be anybody left alive to touch the body block onto Mari? They don't wanna let her get the touch. She does get a little bit of those toes on the point and takes down Z Panther, but is gonna fall for it. And now it's just Stagger City, the Lucio and the Tracer to try and stall. Avery with the Gravitic Flux to remove them from the payload. And that's gonna be Fable capping Numbani. And that is a statement map. Minute 43 on the clock. Plenty of chances to hold on defense and at least are guaranteed to force extra rounds. And they needed that, especially after getting 2 0 on control, especially the way it went down when they were so close to that first point. But again, the least you all think about. And then even on the second point, a very back and forth engagement that just ended up going the way of Aegis when it was all said and done. They, will, they bounce back, they answer back, and now the ball is all in Aegis's court. And they showed us a different look. Like, they they made the Bastion from Arya work, which really makes me question why it didn't come out on Antarctic Peninsula. Maybe they just thought because of the geography of the map it didn't make sense. Maybe if their play style didn't make sense. But they adapted here. I mean, they swapped off of the Lucia. They went, uh, at least for a little bit, they went, um, like, they started with the Ilari, but they did go for the Lucio at least for the Rika test. I do think the Ilari is actually enabling, enabling them a bit more. You can see, like, kind of that consistent damage coming in from the back line a bit more than the speed but now that they're on defense i'm a bit worried because they are going to get run over if they're not able to push them back yeah it's gonna be up to jay on the lucio there i mean i i've read a couple fables in my day i'm familiar with the hero's journey you gotta have the struggle and boy was there the struggle on antarctic peninsula there is now a mountain to overcome and it starts here on numbani and with that attack they do seem primed to be able to do just that but the next task, the next step in the hero's journey is to play defense, and we'll see if Panther is able to keep it up, see if they're able to keep getting some of those big shots on the Ilari. I was very impressed, and if they continue to leverage the high ground, they might be able to keep that momentum up, but as Aegis approach, your wheels go down, speed boost comes out, and everybody from Fable getting run over. Avery and Gusty are so low. Avery is gonna fall. Gusty gonna go down as well, and Aegis take this high ground essentially for free. And yeah, you can leverage the other high ground, get all the pick potential, all the damage you want, but it doesn't amount to anything if you don't have a tank to hold space. With how many games on Numbani, I'm wondering if we're finally going to see a team just try to play the opposite high ground instead of trying to hold this first one of a split approach. Because it has not worked so far. Every team, yeah. unfortunately, for on their defense, is just going to absolutely run over. Even without the Lucio. I mean, we saw Fable do it themselves. Now they're going to get run over a little bit themselves. It's that first one is given up very quickly. And again, this is like, oh. uh, they take out Fifi, so that's huge. But this is the struggle that I'm worried about is like with that Lucio speed, they can just continue to push and push and push on the side of Aegis. Uh, they're gonna keep pushing though despite losing Fifi there and they do indeed push back as Avery gets fouled as does Gusty and Panther and Fable they're gonna keep falling they have to continue to fall back as Aegis just keeps marching on forward and you keep talking about you know the Lucio versus the Ayari as good as Panther is the the Lucio just enables that march forward it makes it so hard for Fable to even have a minute to breathe yeah, the Ilyari really enables you as a player to hit those headshots and get eliminations, but the Lucio enables the entire team just to run in and absolutely run over your opponent. So that team-based style has been working for ages thus far. They're taking the high ground. They're only leaving Jay on the card, so they're trying to really play aggressively here. Maybe try to zone out the people that are caught in here. They actually might be able to get them, but it's going to be an immortality field at least saving the day for a bit, but Zoe not able to get out. It's a great immortality feel that comes out from Gusty, but it is not enough as Zoe does fall, like you said, and Gusty, she's gonna follow. And the rest of Fable are just collapsing like dominoes, being suffocated under the pressure that Aegis is mounting right now. And this is a blazing fast time. 547 in the time bank to try and cap point C. I feel like we might be heading for extra innings unless Fable is able to dig their heels in deep. It's gonna have to be the defensive hold of a lifetime. Maybe swap them some things up. They do have the Captive Sun as well as the Ant Matrix and shortly the Gravitic Flux, but I mean, Aegis still has so much work with Artillery Strike, the Gravitic Flux, their own Sound Barrier is right around the corner. They might just get run over here, even with Fable having some ultimates here. They're going to be just, oh, they get one right off that, they get two. 
Yeah, that's a great play there from Avery, and they still have the Gravitic Flux if they need it. Mari went ahead and popped hers and took down Gusty for it, so a little bit difficult for Fable, and Avery is not actually able to get the Gravitic Flux off, but doesn't even really need to, because the rest of Fable come through, and they're able to stabilize, at least for the time being. They now have control over this corner, and with that Gravitic Flux, can potentially start an ult cycle that keeps them in this map. And Jay used the sound barrier. That is massive. There, there's nothing to counter the blade, the uh, Gravitic Flux. I mean, there is a mortality field, but that can be destroyed. So there's nothing that is like going to be as powerful as that beat, and that's going to be the Gravitic Flux being used. Yeah, there's no immortality field needed. Keith very confident that they don't need it. Jay does fall, though, and the rest of Fable can go ahead and march forward with their, like you said, no sound barrier to stave off the pressure. So the pressure does mount, and Fable, they're sitting pretty right now, and they still have that beat. Or sorry, they still have that blade. And they can just kill time. I mean, that's what they're doing. They go for one pick, they back up. The air magic is going to be thrown into their face. See what they can do. The blade, it's not going to be able to come out. Arya pops the overclock though, but Zoe is not able to pop that dragon blade. And the overclock has just clocked out. Arya falls and Aegis have finally gotten themselves back into this. And Fable on the back foot, it's going to be a... Almost a team kill. It's a little bit staggered there. Zoe gonna be the first one back with that Dragon Blade, but Aegis, they are now once again primed to suffocate Fable and entirely snuff out what little flame they were able to stoke there on their defense. Avery coming out to try and get the touch, put a little bit of damage out, but there's gonna be a lot of damage coming their way. Here comes the Captain Sun. Death is going to fall though. That is great news if you're if you're Fable. Dragon Blade gonna come out and there's still no sound barrier from Jay to stop it. So Zoe gonna find a 3k with it. Fable, stabilize. They do stabilize, but for how long? That was a lot. I mean, they used the overclock in the last fight, played as well as Captain Sun in this one. They do have an air matrix that can potentially stay off pressure, but if Jay gets that beat off in time, if they're able to get the sound barrier, they can just like run straight at them. They can run past the AI Matrix, it's not even a problem. They'll have all the overshield in the world that they'll ever need to get through that. And they might be actually able to catch some of the members of Fable off on high ground. It looks like they get out just in the nick of time. That almost happened for the second time. We saw that happen previously on that second point. But they're gonna be oh. able to drop from here. This is gonna be great positioning. All eyes for me right now are on Gusty and the way that she's able to use the uh, the immortality field because Aegis have that wombo combo, that gravitic flux, and that artillery strike. But death falls before they're able to use it. Arya with a great heads up pick off there. They got to invest their gravitic flux without that artillery strike. And turns out they don't even need it as they turn Arya into a pancake there on the pavement. Panther getting the pick off there onto Jay, and there's still members of Fable able to keep the card in contestion for now. Zoe takes down Fifi, and it's so back and forth, and it's just Mari left for Aegis, not able to get enough to get the card fully capped. The spawn advantage just too much, too insurmountable. Aegis still not able to complete, and Fable still cling to life. And this is where you see the Ilari really pay off, because there's nowhere to run. I mean, the speed boost as a defender does not matter here. You're already backed up all the way in your spawn. When you're able to get the the, the tap onto Jay to get that headshot, able to take them offline, and then even if you fall, just enough, build enough time for this uh, for your team to re-engage. It's all you can need and more. That's huge. Zoe with a pick off there onto Fifi, and Zoe has that Dragon Blade if they're able to use it. Able to get back up to full HP and Aegis, they have to try and play safe. They're gonna go route around the corner here and pop the Ant Matrix, but Fable, they just kite it. They're gonna go ahead and pop the, uh, the Artillery Strike as well to try and force people back, but they're bleeding resources and they haven't found any kills and Fable, they have everything they need. They still have the Blade, they still have the Gravitic Flux. Mari with a huge accretion to take down Gusty though. Gravitic Flux comes down, as does the Captive Sun. It takes down Death. It's so scrappy either way, but it looks like Aegis are getting the better of it and that might be the cap fable still have a couple of resources but are they going to be able to stop this cart the blizzard they need the blizzard on the point that is Zoe the balls. ultimate win con they do get zoe they need it on the cart right now they are going to finally use it that's enough to at least take out aria and this should eventually finally be the capture unless things just somehow flip but i don't see that happening Dragon Blade from Zoe comes out. There is actually potential. Zoe with two, and Gusty had taken out one early on in the fight. Gusty hangs on, or Zoe hangs on, sorry, but gets just a little bit too far away from the cart, and Mari is able to get the cap there. That was, there was potential there for Fable to turn that back in their favor, but just not enough bodies to keep it on the payload, keep themselves on the payload and keep it in contestion. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to call that a C9, just because I, I feel like that's just unlucky. Like, you're dashing through, you just 
miss the point by a sliver. It's, you know, you think you're there, you're not there. It's very unfortunate because I do think there that was full holdable. But even so, like the fact that Fable, it was 540 when they just got to that third point. They killed five, uh, four minutes and 40 seconds off the clock. That is insane. It's now they actually a, have A tier picks and ult cycling. That's all all you have to do, especially once you have that spawn advantage. You use the ults, you press your advantage, and find the picks you need to when you need to find them. And I think the most important thing from all that is that now they actually have the time make advantage. They have almost double the time, almost two minutes. That gives you a lot more time. This is a very far attacker spawn. It takes you quite a while to get there. We're going to look at Zoe stats as Genji did a great job in that final fight, keeping things alive, especially with that blade. But... Like, it, you lose this first fight as Aegis and you don't take it quick enough, that might be it. Like, you might only get one opportunity to go as a full team. So there's a lot more pressure now on Aegis to, like, win this first fight, get that first point capture, and get that cart moving. It doesn't seem, though, that Fable have learned their lesson because they're still going for that split approach. I mean, you know, they have they have the Genji, they're not playing the Ash anymore, but they do have Arya on that Sojourn. And it's still that split high ground approach. You gotta believe Aegis is gonna go for what works, what brought them to the dance so far, and that is speed boosting right in, and they take down Gusty. That is, again, all your healing gone. You can't sustain a tank for all that much longer, so Avery's life is, it's, it's numbered. Their days are numbered. Fable, they have to back up a little bit as Aegis have the high ground here, but Zoe, the hero of the story, going in, taking down death, has to try and get the Mega to try and stay alive, but while they dip away, the rest of the bodies fall, and Aegis are gonna cap point A. They are, Zoe, oh, not gonna be long for this world. Immediately is gonna be taken out. I thought there might be a chance where they contest it, sell it out a little bit longer, but honestly, it doesn't even matter because this is now gonna be overtime no matter what. He just always has to have someone on the cart. They step off it for just a little bit too long. It's going to be lights out for them. So they have to be really careful about their positioning. You see them playing very aggressive. They did this last time. They took this high ground very quickly. You know, it worked out pretty well, but I'm a little bit worried of how far away the cart is. If they lose this fight 4v5 here, like this is it. This is the game over for them here on Numbani. You got to try and stop this cart as quickly as you can. If you're Fable, you can't let this start to spiral out of control. Ant Matrix is going to come out from Keith to try and start that spiral. But Fable, they don't have to show their faces. They don't have to check it too much. They can just let it expire. But that's cart progress. You take that if you're Aegis. But the Immortality Field being forced out means if Zoe gets healed, there might be a way in for the Genji. But Avery gets so, so very low. The Maywall to isolate them. They're able to hold on just a little bit longer. The Captive Sun comes out, but Avery falls. The Captive Sun doesn't find any kills. Gravitic Flux comes out from Mari. Death has fallen, so there's not going to be a whole lot of follow-up for the damage that comes out. Arya popping that overclock. Is it going to be able to find much of anything? It does find that Immortality Field. Zoe with a the kill there onto Jay and Fable are buying their way back into this. They have to invest everything they have, but it might just be enough to finally stall the cart out. And indeed it is halfway through point B is where that cart will stop. And with two minutes, Fable, they have a win condition. If they're chasing that, that storybook ending, that is where the next chapter begins. You gotta remember, this is Aegis in the series lead. It's only a first to two, so this is a very important for Fable. If they want any chance of getting that undefeated record, uh, exiting the day, or the first day of this Swiss stage, this is the last game of the day, the last round of the day. They have to win here to give themselves a chance. Aegis, not exactly in the driver's seat, but still a very good, I would say, a solid push overall with only a minute to spare. They get half at the point B. So really, Aegis has to hold like the first point for a little bit longer. Like They got to kill some time off the clock. The second point, it almost always goes the way of the attacker eventually. So it's going to be all about how they hold this first point down. And I really want to see not the same exact hold that every team has tried on defense and every team has fallen using. Uh, I, it doesn't have to necessarily be like on the other hack or just anything else, you know? I, I'd like to see a successful defense just once on point A, please. Just a crumb <laughs> of successful defense. Don't just get run over by a Lucio and a Bastion on the high ground and be forced to like vacate the premises. Yeah, this Bastion put in quite a bit of work has helped get their team into this potential series clinching scenario, but still some more work to be done. I think with this May, they have to, like, you gotta wall someone off, but there's gonna be a bash on the other side. There's gonna be an echo flying around. So this wall might not be nearly as useful as you'd expect it to be, because you think you wall someone off, oh, it's an instant kill, but with all this, like, burst damage, it might not really amount to much. They might just get run over again. 
There's still no Lucio though, so you have to be careful. Panther has to be able to keep the heals up and hit the shots. And Zoe has to come in from behind and get the big sticky bombs. But Avery is there with the damage and Fable, they're able to stabilize. They're able to just bait Aegis into their trap and that's a team kill. And if that isn't a point a cap, I don't know what is. It's not looking good for Aegis getting the 2-0, but it's looking pretty good that we might be going to Flashpoint. It's a little bit more push from Fable <laughs> to get it across the finish line. Here's the most important thing with how quickly they get that point. They could actually potentially lose a fight here and still have time to recontest. It really depends on where. Like, they got to lose it basically at this corner. They still have like 20, 30 seconds left. But it's possible. So they've given themselves, you know, a, like a condition where they can lose and still lose a fight and still potentially win out the map. So there's a lot on the line here. Because they cap so quickly though, Aegis did actually get really good spawns. So you can see how close they're able to hold right now. Fable has to find a kill and hopefully do it close enough to overtime so they can start to leverage those OT spawns. They gotta try and go in and make this fight quick. A nice wall there from Fifi to try and segment off Avery, but it's not able to confirm the kill. But they do find Gusty, but the Gravitic Flux comes out. Is it going to find anything? It looks like everybody from Fable is still alive and healthy. The Gravitic Flux from Mari isn't able to find anything. Avery is just killing everyone right now. That's a 4k for Avery and Fable. They keep their feet on the gas. They're still alive. One more fight and they may have bought themselves into map three. Avery really said that you look at those stats, 44 Elim, 7, 17,000 damage done. Really showing that you can be a DPS on a tank. And here we go, final fight. This will be a recontest. They swap to the emergency Reinhardt just to charge back in. The Reinhardt and the Moira, they're on fast heroes. The only hope they really have is that sound barrier. But Jay get, gets Ajax. They're not able to use the sound barrier. And the Captive Sun from Panther comes out. All the damage coming in. The kills are going Fable's way. Keith is able to find Gusty, though. Panther. And Panther is very low. Has to try and take a little bit of a dip behind cover. No way. Good measure. But Fifi with the Blizzard. Everyone from Fable, they're falling at the final hurdle. That pickup onto Gusty was everything. And Aegis, they're able to stabilize. They're able to stay alive. There's still just a couple of members to try and dislodge. You've got Panther taking a timeout in the corner just to keep the payload in contention. Gusty is back on the Lucio. Avery back in on the Doomfist, but there is no taking Aegis off of this payload right now. They are glued with Gorilla Glue onto the top of it. That duplicate comes out from Zoe. Are they able to find anything with it? Avery falls. The Shatter isn't able to go off. Arya with the overclock finds a kill, but it's not enough. There's not enough bodies, and it was so close, but Aegis are able to hold on with the emergency rush pick, the emergency Reinhardt and Moira. They broke the glass, brought it out, and despite Heroic plays from Fable. Aegis take this series two to zero. That is heartbreaking. That is a heartbreaking way for this series to end. It looks like Fable had cracked the code. They get such a good first attack. They win this fight pretty solidly. But I think the issue is they just used too much to win that fight there. They had time on the clock. They could have lost it. They licked their wounds, backed up, gone for another fight after. But instead, they allow for this swap to come out. The Ryan Brawl with Moria, uh, Moira, and it works. They just swing for the fences. They get all the damage in that they need. They sustain so well. Moira, everyone thinks about Moira as like, oh, just, you know, DPS just like completely does damage the entire time. No aim, no brain, etc. etc. But her healing orbs are crazy. They do so much healing, and you saw it come out at the very end. It's what kept Mari alive, and it's what kept their team in the fight. They just wait, taking one of the most amazing back and forth first of two series i've ever seen in my career and they are punching their ticket to three and out they are now one of the teams to beat looking very very good throughout this swiss stage absolutely i love the pick from uh the reinhardt pick from mari there fable i mean my heart goes out to them because that was so close that is a very crushing way to lose numbani if they're still chasing that fairy tale ending luckily we're only in swiss stage so there's still a chance they still have a winning record we may still be seeing more of them in playoffs and i want to see more big plays coming out from avery if that's the case because that 4k was absolutely everything to play like that and for it to be that close it's crushing it, it, it just it, there's no other words to describe it to feel like you did everything you could and to come up just an inch short there are more chapters to this story for fable but today was not their day. The heroes of this story are Aegis. Yeah, they're enemies, they're villains. Aegis, they win this round, but the heroes always rise up once again, and I'm sure Fable will find some good footing later on as we continue on here in Congo Heroes Minor 3.
I just gotta say, like, you could see the heart and soul from these competitors. I think, you know, we, we could say, oh, maybe we saw a little bit of trolling earlier on, but this was just all out, constantly, like, top performance level play. Everyone was giving it their all, and mistakes happen. It's just, you know, this is not the best decisions happen, but everyone gave it their all, all the time, and that's all I could ask for. You can just, you don't even have, like, player cams or anything, but I can just tell, like, you know, from the way they were playing, the way they were setting these fights up, the, the rotations, the alt management, all of it, everyone was giving it 110%, and that is exactly why we're here. Yeah, it is, it is called calling all heroes for a reason. We put out the call, and these two teams, damn sure picked it up and answered, and they came to play, and again, just so close for Fable there. All of the series today that we've had today have been super, super close. The score lines don't reflect it despite being 2-0. I cannot wait to see what these teams do for the rest of the tournament because we still have another day of Swiss play plus the playoffs next weekend. And I want to see I want to see all the teams that we saw today go the distance. But Aegis is definitely going to be a big threat. Someone that might just go the distance, still boasting that perfect record coming out of a barn burner against Fable. It's pretty crazy, you know, uh, never, not gonna say, like, on paper they don't look good because they have some very strong players, as you mentioned, but I don't think, looking at the initial, like, draw of the Swiss stage, I would have said, like, this is a team that's gonna be 3-0 after day one, this is a team that's gonna be undefeated after day one, but they are proving me, they're proving the doubters wrong, and they're gonna march forward at least, like, at worst they finish 3-2, and two, which is huge because <laughs> that's not necessarily gonna lock up a spot in the playoffs, but that is gonna get you very, very close to one. Look at the difference. The difference that the Bastion makes that we kept alluding to. Look at the damage that Death put out. And sure, that's, you know, a little more than double the damage for roughly double the time played, but it's value. This hero is driving the meta, and, you know, he's not a must pick, but if you pick Bastion and you put the enemy tank under that much pressure, it just equals wins. It just puts so much pressure and forces so many errors, so many misplays out of the enemy team that they're just scrambling to try and find a solution, trying to find a way to deal with you. And sometimes there were glimmers where Fable was able to do just that. And they even did indeed force death off of that Bastion time and time again. We saw that, you know, kind of high death count, but despite the death count, the value was there. Aegis got so much value out of that pick and Fable just weren't able to match it. And I, yeah. I, you know, my personal belief is that what that's what it comes down to. But you could also say that it comes down to how close that that last fight was. How close it all came down to in the very end. But we have, we're going to have an interview with one of the members of Aegis to see how they feel once they've taken a minute to breathe, unclench for a little bit, because that, that was a clencher there towards the end. <clears throat> yep, we're going to be taking a break. So interview right after that.
Welcome back, everybody. I uh, I went a little hard there. My voice is still recovering from that last fight there. So thankfully, I get to be joined by Mari coming in from Team A, just the winner of that last matchup there to help uh, help take some of the pressure off me. And hopefully she got a little bit of pressure off of her after that one. It was a very close fight. But Mari, how are you doing? Are you excited to be back for another Calling All Heroes tournament? I'm spectacular. I'm so excited. I, I love playing in Calling Heroes. It's like what I look forward to every every couple of months. It's 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 what I live for. Calling All Heroes is, is is in my blood. We love it to hear that. Deep. Yep. And you put on one heck of a performance. Definitely show that it runs in your veins because wow. You, you, I mean, your team as a whole, Aegis, has been doing incredible so far. 3-0 after the first day of Swiss. I gotta ask, you know, with some of these more well-known team names, some of these really popular and famous players and streamers, were you guys expecting to be doing this well early on? 100%. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, I, I knew, I knew I was gonna do good. My team knew they were gonna do good. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised with how today was. Uh, we just, we just gotta keep it going into tomorrow and into next weekend. Absolutely. Well, I love the confidence. It definitely showed in your play. I wanted to talk about that last fight, though. I mean, CB's talking about how her voice is gone from it. I was in a, I, I was just amazed that you guys were able to turn it around. I, I mean, let's talk about it. You swapped to the emergency Reinhardt. You swapped to Moira. The cart's almost at that uh, box of victory. They were so close to capturing it. How was your team able to pull off that fight win and win the map and the series? Um... To be totally honest, I I don't know. That's a good answer. That's <laughs> I, a really good answer because we don't either. <laughs> I don't know. I when, when I go Reinhardt, I don't know what's happening. Like I I I, I don't play that character, so it's like I, I'm just trying to live for as long as possible. I, I didn't swing on a lot. I, I just held right click and then hoped my team would kill them and also not die. Um, I just I was playing for fun essentially at that point. I, I I was letting letting the dice roll, letting the letting the coin flip. Sometimes all it takes is just a big rectangle and a ton of faith in your team, and it's I mean it's clear in those in those moments where it mattered the most that you did have faith in your team. And speaking of your team, not many of the other teams in this tournament might have been looking at your team to be a potential threat. But now that you've gone 3-0, you have to be considered one of the favorites to make it to playoffs and potentially make a deep run. So call your shot. Which teams are you looking at? Who is next on the chopping block for Aegis? Um, I think everybody. I think I think we beat everybody. Ooh. No prisoners, let's go. I mean, I mean, I think I beat everybody, but I need my team to think they can beat everybody too. Just Samari it, Diff. That, that's it, all it yeah, is, yeah. Samari Diff. I, I, like I said, if you got faith in your team, I believe in you to be able to motivate them to uh, to bring that level, bring that level of play. And hey, if you play like you guys did today, able to clutch it out in those key moments, I don't think that there's anybody that you can't beat. So I I believe. I'm an Aegis believer now. I appreciate it. All right, but uh, I mean, that's going to that's gonna pretty much do it for the interview. I want to go ahead and give you an opportunity to give any, uh, any shout outs to any of your teammates or anybody. That might be watching that you want to say hi to and thank for uh thank for being here and uh you know the floor is yours um i mean i, I as always like shout out my parents for like helping me do want to do path to pro and stuff like they're very supportive um which means a lot to me and i take it for granted sometimes um i mean shout out my team of course i trust them i love them they're very good they're awesome um Shout out, shout out Caster, shout out Prod, CB Jag, at everyone. Um, thanks for making making another good tournament where I can uh, win, hopefully. <laughs> like I said, I mean, I, I, I believe in you. I believe you can win, but thank you so much for the kind words for one thing, but also thank you so much for joining us for the interview. It's always a pleasure to get to say hi to Mari and check in and see how you're doing. Welcome back. And uh, again, everybody, you're going to want to keep your eyes on Aegis because this looks like one of the teams to beat. You know, we talked about teams like Valiant Guardians or, you know, Washington Timeless that we saw in the previous matchup, you know, that might be potential favorites. We talked about teams like Drainers that we saw at the top of the evening that could also be potential favorites. But Aegis has to be in that conversation after today. 
and you love to see it. I mean, I think there's some big names, some big team names out there, but when you see a team like this just play this well, they really become that dark horse. They really become that underdog story that we'd love to see. And we're going to actually see exactly how the standings look after our first full day of play to see where they are. Oh, first place. Mm. Let's go, Aegis. Just right above the Washington Timeless. Vancouver Titans Blue, as well as Drainers, two teams that we've seen one on stream drop actually to two in one. This is really exciting. GRE Nightmare also have only played two matches, but like also undefeated. Like, I did not expect the top eight to look like this whatsoever, but that's what makes it so much more fun. There's so many different possibilities of how this could all end before we actually get to that playoff bracket. Unfortunately, it looks like we're having some production issues. Hopefully we can get CB back in here in just a moment. I mean, looking at the standings, I mean, Bad Blood, a team that we had mentioned earlier on in the day, uh, they were one of the teams on the bubble for making it into that top six and in that guaranteed spot at that championship finals that will be happening later in 2024. And finding them at one and two, a bit surprising, but that's just how it is in Calling on Heroes. Anyone can rise and be the hero they want to be. And with that, we want to remind you that tomorrow we're going to have rounds four through six starting at 2 p.m. Eastern slash 11 a.m. Pacific time. CB, do I have you back now? You do. Thank you so much, Discord, for crashing. But at least it held out until we were just about done. Uh, you know, I came back and I hear you talking about the games that we have tomorrow. I'm glad that we got to play or got to see some of the games that we saw today. But yeah, like you were saying, there is more action to come tomorrow and you definitely definitely do not want to miss it absolutely we'll be seeing k-wing and chef billy our good friends and other casters that are just amazing and in the scene as part of this amazing community going to be taking the mic for us tomorrow so you want to be there for that but i think that's all we got for them tonight uh, just about i mean thank you guys so much for all tuning in for the day the first day of the calling all heroes rise together minor three hosted by toronto defiant thank you so much to Toronto Defiant for hosting this event. It's been a wonderful first day and it's just the tip of the iceberg. So be sure to come back tomorrow to see those games, to see how things uh, shape up going into playoffs. Don't forget to check in next weekend to see the playoffs and see it all come to fruition. All of these heroes have answered the call. It's uh, It's been a hell of a day. Thank you guys all so much for showing up and we'll see you guys tomorrow.